Good afternoon. Welcome everybody to this uh, new afternoon of science uh, here at, in, uh, in Lausanne. We are happy to welcome you. My name is Sara Bonella. I am deputy director of SICA. And together with the Marvel NCCR, we are very, very happy to um, start today our fifth SICA uh, Marvel classic in molecular simulations and modeling. Um, today, we are very happy to have with us Thanos Panagiotopoulos and Dominic Tisley, who will uh, hopefully all activate their cameras and uh, who will take us on a journey on the history and, and modern developments of the simulation of phase equilibria for, for pure component and mixtures. The Gibbs Ensemble method will play, I think, a big part in the stories that we're here going to hear today. Um, the, the classics are structured in two parts. In the first one, we have originators of new methods, in this case, Thanos and Dominic, who tell us about technical and uh, historical aspects of what they have done for us. And in the second part, uh, this uh, personal account mi mixture of history and technical aspects of science get even uh, more in intertwined and, and entangled through a very informal interview session that um, we share with our guests. Today, we have the pleasure of welcoming Beren Smith as the person who will be in charge of leading this interview. Um, I think I don't want to take uh, out much of the time for today. I just want to start by sharing my screen to inform you of a couple of technical points before we start. So this meeting uh, will be recorded because we like to collect videos of these lectures and, and in general of all the series that Marvel and, and CCAM propose so that we can then store them on our website or publish them on our YouTube channels. This is a webinar mode, which means that uh, all participants are not able to share uh, sound or video for the whole duration of the session, and also that you cannot use the chat session here. So your only way to communicate with us, and we do want you to communicate with us, even though we have uh, forbidden all these things, is through the Q&A facility of the Zoom webinar. If you have a question, if you have a comment, please type it down in that session. And then the chair, me, in the first part of the session, and then later Berend, will relay them to the speakers. Now, today we have a very exciting afternoon of science, but SICAM and Marvel, uh, that builds on our experience for these classic uh, series. Uh, you know, you can have a look here on this slide at, at previous installments, and you can see that we try to cover a wide range of topics, but all these uh, sessions are characterized on the fact that we are focusing on methods or algorithms that have really become tools of the trade in what we do every day in our science. Uh, this uh, is not the only series or not the only set of events that we try to coordinate together. Um, we have a few more coming up on our calendar. And uh, these are the ones in the next couple of months, uh, starting next Thursday with our third uh, session of the Mixed Gen series, focusing on, on simulations of colloidal systems. Emanuela Zaccarelli will discuss for us the anomalous slow dynamics in soft matter. This will be followed in January by another episode of the Sika Marvel Classics, in this case with Lucia Reining, uh, Stephen Louis, and Rex Godby, who will discuss ab initio studies of electronic excitations using many body perturbation theories, to be followed on February 8th uh, by a Marvel Distinguished Lecture by Sharon Glotzer on the nature of the entropic bond. Um, now, as you can see, the level of diversity in the, in the mixture of speakers that we invite increases with, uh, you know, coming, going from the past to the future. Um, and we're going to try to celebrate even more diversity in our field on February 11, when we are going to organize a rather special event, I think, on the occasion of the UN Day uh, for Women and Girls in Science. This is a session called From Women's Eyes, and the idea is to host online a conversation between four women scientists that, uh, through their experiences in different uh, moments of the history of our field, have contributed and can tell us about their own experiences. So we start with Ruth Lindel Bell, uh, Julia Galli, Clemence Cormin Boeuf, and Magali Benoit. Uh, this is the future. Uh, all these events are described in on the SICAM and Marvel websites, where you can find also recording of past sessions. What we're going to do today instead is, uh, after this very brief introduction from me, is we're going to concentrate on the fluid phase equilibria 
studies by computer simulations. So, as I said, two parts in this event. The first one <laughs> is characterized by two talks, uh, Athanasios Panagiotopoulos, ah, I had practiced, but okay. Athanasios Panagiotopoulos is our first speaker for the day uh, with a talk titled Fluid Phase Equilibria by Computer Simulations. After this talk, there will be questions and answers followed by a short break. And then Dominic Disley will discuss for us molecular simulations of fluid phase equilibria, multi-component mixtures and pores. Following this second talk and the questions and answers that will come with it, we will move to the part of this session that has to do with uh, you know, the personal recollections and the interview uh, conducted by Berlin Smith with our two speakers. The plan is to finish around uh, 5.45 uh, this afternoon. Okay, this is really all I wanted to say because I think it's much more interesting to actually um, take the time today to go through the different talks and, and give our speakers and you from the audience a chance to interact with us. As usual, with all these uh, CCAM and Marvel events, we try to uh, be as interactive as possible. And so a large part of the success of today is going to depend on how many questions, on how curious you are going to be. And uh, curiosity can be technical, scientific, or you know, if you are interested in learning more about how new ideas come about, how a young scientist can think about a new ensemble, for example, uh, this is also the opportunity for you to ask these questions. With that, um, I think I am ready to just give the floor to Thanos for the first talk of the day. Thank you. So Thanos, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much uh, for the introduction. Uh, I hope everyone can see my screen and my cursor in uh, presentation mode, yes? Yeah. Um, and uh, I would like to really, really thank uh, SICAM uh, and Marvel for the opportunity. Um, this is, uh, of course, a, a, an area, um, molecular simulations of, of fluid phase equilibria, that has been um, the focus of, of a lot of efforts by a lot of people, including my own uh, career. And what I'd like to do in the next 45 minutes or so is to present a personal view, not a review of everything that happened, but basically a review of developments as seen by one of the participants in the field, myself, of the relatively early developments in the field. And of course, as already mentioned, the Gibbs Ensemble will play um, some important role in this uh, development. Um, if I understood correctly, there will be questions at the end of my talk as well, right through the Q&A. Is that correct? That is correct. So I will make sure that there is enough uh, room time-wise for questions. So let me start by just uh, reminding everyone, although I don't think this is really necessary in this audience, that fluid phase equilibria are really important for many different fields of science and engineering. I was trained as a chemical engineer throughout my undergraduate and graduate studies. So Especially in those times, chemical engineers really, the education of a chemical engineer revolved around separations using fluid phases. So a typical one being a distillation column. This is from a very nice schematic that Philippe Bonjarer um, put together for a conference uh, that runs every few years, um, showing that the, the distillation column, which separates um, mixtures, fluid mixtures into their components, you can think about it as a unit uh, operating at the macroscopic level. You write macroscopic equations. You can look at transport phenomena at a slightly more uh, narrow, more microscopic level, although still not a molecular level. Look uh, at transport coefficients and, and so on and so forth. Heat and mass transfer, which is important at this level. But roughly in the 80s, and 90s, people started really being able to describe these separation between phases using molecular level calculations. And the focus of today's classic series with uh, Dominic and myself is precisely to explain the development of those techniques and how they came about and how they relate to each other and perhaps uh, how they're evolving 
even currently. Um, I should say, of course, uh, these uh, fluid phase equilibria are important for atmospheric geological sciences. And I was really fascinated in the recent years to see them become extremely important also for biology. Um, a um, landmark study by my colleague here in the chemical and biological engineering department at Princeton, uh, Cliff Brangwin, uh, when he was a postdoc uh, in the group of Tony Hyman, uh, published in 2009, showed that organelles, membrane-less organelles within cells are really liquid droplets and they come about by phase separation, fluid phase separation in disordered proteins. And since then, this field has really exploded and it's become very uh, uh, intense, a topic of intense studies from many different uh, areas. And uh, a recent review article by Cliff Branwin uh, shows how this principle of phase separation in fluids in biology can be used as a principle to sequester components, to organize components, and also to make reactions go uh, at a certain, at a controlled rate uh, by having uh, local concentrations higher um, at specified uh, parts of a cell. So this is, uh, this is a really important field. How did the origins of molecular level simulations of phase equilibria come about? And I was not the first person to think about this, but um, I will start by um, giving a little bit of an introduction of the state of the art before the um, mid eighties. I was a graduate student at MIT. I came from uh, Athens, Greece, where I did my undergraduate to be a graduate student at MIT and picked a very a wonderful classical thermodynamicist by the name of Robert C. Reed, Bob Reed. You'll see a picture of him in a couple of slides as my advisor. Um, and my topic was uh, both modeling and experiments on high pressure phase equilibria. Supercritical fluids were really big at the time, um, which was great. I, I, I loved it. I did some equation of state work. Uh, but in the second half of my PhD, I, I felt that I really wanted to see whether some molecular level calculations can, can be applied to this important problem for chemical engineers. A very important um, element at the time and, 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 and one set of studies that really excited my imagination as to what is possible was the uh, series of studies that uh, were done by Keith Gubbins, who ended up being my mentor and, and department chair uh, shortly after that, and uh, Sir John Rawlinson um, on a liquid drop. So these were molecular dynamics calculations. They were not phase equilibria per se, but they were trying to understand the structure of a liquid droplet at equilibrium with its vapor. And this is an image from this paper appeared in 1984 with uh, Keith Gubbins and uh, Steve Thompson and Ronison and his co-workers. I want to, to show you down here the uh, time scale for molecular dynamics calculations that was feasible at the time using really heroic efforts, really long, months long uh, simulations on the computers available at the time. Um, 75,000 time steps, uh, that's roughly 75 picoseconds. So it's really, really short times, and it was not really easy to set up macroscopic or, or big systems sufficient to really measure uh, liquid and vapor at equilibrium and equilibrate the system through transport through the interface. Um, there were other studies at the time, and I believe uh, Dominic has a couple of slides on, on the state of the art prior to, to that time. What I did in my PhD is a very laborious and, and time consuming and difficult set of calculations in which I used a method called Widom test particle insertions. This is just taking a particle and inserting it randomly in a fluid to get the chemical potential as a function of 
composition and density of the mixture or pressure, if you wish. And so this was published in, in 1986. This was the last half of my PhD um, in collaboration with uh, Uri Suter, who was a relatively a young faculty member at MIT at the time. Uh, he left a few years after I had left to come to uh, at the Ha in Zurich. Um, and you will see him appear in subsequent slides. And of course, uh, Robert C. Reed, Bob Reed, my advisor at MIT. So the, this is the abstract. Uh, um, that, that work, I should say, uh, got me my faculty position at Cornell in that uh, when, I interview, uh, when I interviewed in my last year, um, I went to Cornell, to Ithaca. Keith Gubbins was the department chair there. And I presented this work, and I think it was really very much appreciated by Keith at the time that, well, this is a very difficult calculation, it has not really been done at this level of accuracy before, so this person may be worth giving a, an assistant professorship to. So this is a summary from that work. This was a very, this is, by the way, a picture. I didn't have one. I tried to use pictures of the people involved and in many cases, I have my own pictures of these people, but in this particular case, I didn't have a good one of Ben Widom. Ben Widom, of course, became my colleague at Cornell a few years after, um, a couple of years after I did the study. The study was done with uh, very simple Lena Jones mixtures. So mixture one in the study was one that had two components of the same potential well depth, epsilon, and the same size, both pure and mixed cross. Uh, but the unlike pair interaction, epsilon one, two, was lower than the like interactions, as a result of which, at this particular temperature, reduced temperature, the system would show a vapor liquid azeotrope, symmetric, the mixture is symmetric at 0.5, and then a liquid liquid phase separation at higher pressure. So these points and their error bars are the result of many, many uh, we don't test particle insertion calculations of the chemical potentials of the two components. And then we would set uh, pressure, of course, must be the same. Temperature is controlled in Monte Carlo simulations. And when the chemical potentials of the two components are equal, that's the condition of phase equilibrium. And that's how this diagram is constructed. Um, so wonderful, um, the, um, the position at Cornell uh, came to me in the spring of, was given to me in the spring of 86. But before that time, Keith Gubbins had suggested that I would come to work with him as a postdoc at Oxford, um, where he was hosted by John Rawlinson. Uh, when I became a faculty member at Cornell, this was of course not a very appropriate arrangement. So he said, come anyway and be on your own. Just spend a year before you start your faculty position, um, just being, uh, being an independent postdoc. And of course, that's a wonderful opportunity. I wish uh, many people had that. Uh, and I took it and I went to Oxford after finishing the PhD. And of course, I started immediately thinking, what do I do? Um, I wasn't given a problem to work on. Um, and I, I, I was very much influenced by the classical thermodynamics thinking of Bob Reed, who has very nice schematics. I'll show one in, in, in um, a second um, on how to think about the problem of phase behavior. And so uh, very fairly early on, sometime in September, I believe I was uh, standing or waiting for, the, uh, for a bus to come to take me home. Um, and it was raining, it was miserable. Um, and the thought came to me that maybe there's a way to implement those conditions of phase coexistence, equality of pressure uh, and chemical potentials in a direct way. Uh, faster, much faster than the indirect method I was using before. And that's indeed what happened. Um, I believe uh, Dominic, who was editor in, of molecular physics at the time, received this paper. He has a slide, I believe, in his presentation uh, on his side. I submitted that uh, in December. This was very quick. So I thought about it in, in, in uh, 
September, wrote the code. They had a nice Cray one at the time at Oxford, and I, I ran the simulations. They were beautifully consistent with previous results, and everything worked out very well. So I submitted the paper um, to molecular physics, um, and and Dominic got it, and, and I believe he immediately saw that this is this is a, an important uh, potential development. He got very quick, uh, by the time, this is very quick um, acceptance between uh, December 22nd and January 22nd over the holiday break. So what does the method, what is the method? How does it work? Many people have seen it out, of course, have to summarize it here. Um, the method implements the conditions of phase coexistence in a way that uh, these conditions are satisfied um, when you sample a sufficient uh, number of, of steps in a Monte Carlo sense uh, by having two separate boxes, each one of them representative of a bulk phase. So we put these boxes within periodic boundary conditions. One is representing phase one, it could be a vapor, it could be a liquid. Um, and the other one is representing phase two. Again, it could be vapor or liquid. I don't know why this is moving by itself. Um, and so these pieces of the bulk phases can be quite small. Uh, as you will see later on, many people have used the approach having just 64 molecules when you have very expensive calculations, for example, ab initio quantum mechanical calculations doing the energy to get the energy, then you may want to use very small systems. And it's entirely possible to do that uh, since each phase is not in direct contact with the other. So these phases are then coupled uh, by volume changes where one shrinks and the other expands by the same amount or particle transfers. You take a random particle from one phase and you put it in the other phase and the reverse. And of course, for internal equilibration, it will be important to do displacements. So the acceptance conditions, which you can get by taking the ratio of the probabilities of the microstates uh, are written here. It's an exponential of the Boltzmann factor of the change in energy times a factor that depends on whether you have particle transfers or volume changes. And people who do simulations will recognize this very easily as sort of entropic terms that appear there. And I should say there was a little uh, mistake in the way I had derived the acceptance criteria for the particle transfers in the original paper where this N2 plus one wasn't there, it was just N2. So it was an order of one over N uh, approximation that I did by the way I derived it through classical thermodynamics essentially, not through statistical mechanics. So how does this work? As I already said, very beautifully, um, this is a calculation done several years after that on a, on a laptop, uh, roughly 2000 or so. And if you take the two phases initially to be in the unstable region of the Leonard Jones vapor liquid phase diagram, then the two phases are here. The reduced density is 0.3. The reduced temperature is 1.1 below the critical point. These two boxes, uh, are identical in any way, but of course the system does not want to be in the unstable region of the phase diagram. It will lower the free energy by phase separating, and indeed after some small fluctuations, the two phases, um, one expands, the other shrinks, particles are transferred, and of course these fluctuations are inherent because of the small system size we use, and you can read off the average density of the liquid and gas. And in the case of a multi-component mixture, the composition of the coexisting phases quite directly. So this is the time scale here is seconds on a laptop in 2000, but on the Cray at Oxford, it was half an hour or an hour. Um, much, much, much faster than what was possible before. So I promised to, uh, to tell you uh, how this came about. So this is a, a modified sketch from Bob Reed's thermodynamics book that I used uh, as a graduate student at MIT from a card he sent me 
after he got the uh, reprint of the method um, and, and wanted to sort of uh, share his, his excitement about it. And it shows in the book, this is a, a, a typical person studying thermodynamics. He has a Gibbs book in front of him. Gibbs was the idol of Bob Breed and was uh, very much, uh, um, you'll see um, in a second, uh, uh, there's even a physical resemblance between uh, Gibbs and, and Bob Breed. Um, and the person is thinking about the equilibrium between two parts of a system, uh, alpha and beta. And he put down Oxford Cray in the book. Of course, there is no Oxford Cray. It wasn't, uh, it, it wasn't part of the uh, original drawing. Um, and then many years after that, uh, actually only about a year or so before he died in 2006, Bob Reed, uh, whose picture is shown here, sent me a beautiful note, very moving, uh, and I'll read it. Uh, Recollections of our small but close-knit thermodynamic group suggest to me that we would like to know, if you don't already, that the US Postal Service has released a sheet of stamps honoring American scientists. One of them is uh, J. Willard Gibbs. I'm enclosing one for you. I retain a great respect for uh, J. Willard and his work. His volumes reside permanently uh, and his health has been marginal and indeed uh, died after a year he, um, he had written this. So the Gibbs Ensemble, the name came because somehow I didn't want people to refer to this as the Panagiotopoulos Ensemble. I'm still wondering whether that was a, a wise choice or not. And because Gibbs had played such an important role in my own training in thermodynamics and in my advisor's uh, uh, line of thinking, if you wish. Um, so, of course, uh, some people, even at the time, um, I, 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 I checked this um, designation with, uh, with a few people and, and some suggested, you know, may, that may be a little confusing. And it was a little, indeed a little confusing because um, as you can see here from uh, a, a, an entry in Wikipedia, sometimes the canonical ensemble is called the Gibbs Ensemble in honor of Gibbs. Um, and, and, uh, but I think by now, uh, this is secondary consideration and most people think of the Gibbs Ensemble as the one in which you do a simulation in two boxes. And I should say, and bring in uh, a couple of other important players at this point, uh, one is uh, Darren Smith uh, that is hosting the, uh, the interview session at the end of the uh, presentations and with whom we've had a very long uh, friendship and association. Somehow I didn't find, I wasn't able to find a good photo in my own files. I do have, of course, a, a photos, many photos of, of Dan Frankel and that's one, not particularly good one, but it's from a conference in uh, Brazil, I think, or in Argentina, sorry, that we went together. So Beren was a PhD student with Dan Frankel at the time. Uh, actually, he had just moved to Shell um, in, in, in Amsterdam and they wrote a beautiful paper in which they demonstrated that the Gibbs ensemble and canonical ensemble are equivalent in the thermodynamic limit and discussed various aspects of the applicability of the method near a critical point and really put the statistical mechanical foundation of the Gibbs ensemble on a very firm basis. And I'm really grateful for that. And we had many, many interactions and, and wonderful collaborations um, down the line from that point on. So um, this is slightly uh, out of chronological sequence. The second paper, on the Gibbs ensemble that came from my Oxford work was not as most people would have expected on mixtures. That came, became the third paper and that was a collaboration with Dominic Tildesley and his then student, Mike Stapleton. The second paper was one inspired by work done in Keith Gubbins's group on fluids in pores. So, um, you can see here the dates, this was in May. Um, the group of Keith Gubbins at Cornell was studying the equilibrium or pseudo equilibrium because strictly speaking in a one dimensional pore, you don't have true macroscopic phase equilibrium between the phases of uh, a liquid and a gas in a pore. So I um, 
thought that this can be easily done by the Gibbs Ensemble by having the same kinds of groups, uh, internal equilibration within two pore regions and volume transfer and particle transfers. And you get a result that matches quite nicely with the very laborious molecular dynamics calculations of two regions. And this is how the phase diagram in the pore compares with the phase diagram of the cut and shifted uh, pure fluid in the bulk. Um, I should say that didn't earn me too many friends in the group of, of Keith Gubbins that was actually studying this uh, using different methods, uh, but that's okay. Um, and then the uh, next paper was on mixtures, which started when I was at Oxford, but then was completed and submitted when I had already moved to Cornell uh, in the fall of 1987. So I was, uh, I was there, I was very happy. Uh, this is a picture of the uh, statistical mechanics and thermodynamics group at Cornell a couple of years after I had joined the group and Keith Gubbins of course is here. I am here and uh, the other people are, are PhD students and postdocs and some visitors um, in, in, in that group. Um, so the third, paper and one that really uh, gave the correct acceptance criteria and then generalized the original method to uh, membrane equilibria, osmotic equilibria, if you wish, was done um, as, a, as a wonderful collaboration with uh, Dominic uh, Pildesley and Mike Stapleton, his PhD student at the time, who became my first postdoc, and then uh, Nick Quirk, who was uh, at BP Research at the time uh, and, and with whom we collaborated uh, on and off for a number of years after that. So in that mixture paper, we redid the calculations we had done, I had done in, uh, in my PhD on those mixtures, including the mixture one, the one that has the azeotrope, and just this diagram demonstrates that both the uh, constant volume Gibbs method the constant pressure Gibbs method, which is possible if you have one more degree of freedom given by mixtures, and the earlier calculations are in, in very good agreement. Uh, again, the advantage of the Gibbs being that it is much faster and much more direct in the case of simple mixtures. This is again, a simple Leonard Jones mixture. So um, that's all good. Um, but the original method, of course, relies on taking a particle from one box and placing it in another box, which is not very efficient. It, the sampling becomes impractical if you have uh, more than a couple of centers in a molecule, more than a few atoms, or if you have strong interactions such as water and electrolytes. So I was very happy that, that uh, a number of people really took this problem to heart and solved it. And it wasn't me or my group. It was um, specifically uh, the group of, of uh, actually, I should say it was uh, Beren Smith and, and Dan Frankel uh, in, uh, in, in Amsterdam uh, and Juan de Pablo, who had become, had finished his PhD with John Prausnitz and became a postdoc in Zurich with uh, Ulrich Schutter. And I believe this photograph is taking in, in, in Lausanne, uh, unless I'm mistaken, uh, some years after, after we, we were there for a APFL meeting. And this is uh, Ilya Sipman at the same conference. Uh, I showed you the uh, slide with uh, Dan Frankel. Um, and he was working with Dan Frankel uh, to get something called configurational bias Monte Carlo. So these three papers are all in 1992 and they are all asking the question, how can we make transfers from one phase to another feasible in the case of polyatomic or chain molecules where direct transfers are impossible. And the principle of the method is of course um, easy to describe, but we need to be very careful on, the, uh, on doing proper unbiasing so that the uh, correct distributions are obtained from the transfers under this sampling scheme, uh, which involves 
growing the chain molecules one bead at a time by looking around. So this is the uh, bead that is growing and you don't place it in a random location. You look around and find the energetically favorable, actually you do it probabilistically with boson factors, uh, location to place the new bead within a dense system. So eventually these three beads will grow to the full length, which in, the, in this particular case is five beads long and become part of the new phase. So this gradual insertion makes it possible to transfer polyatomic molecules and to uh, enhance the efficiency of the transfers to make it practical for much more strongly interacting systems. So uh, this was great. And uh, a first, uh, one of the first applications that really uh, caught the attention of very many people was one that was done by Ilya Sipman and Bernd Smith uh, with their collaboration with Sami Karaborni, collaborator Sami Karaborni uh, from Shell Research where Berend had been. Um, and this is, the critical density, the critical properties, and specifically the critical density of normal alkanes. Uh, and in this plot, the open symbols are experimental data. And there were two sets of experimental data and they were contradicting each other in terms of whether the critical density keeps going up, uh, this is the carbon number, or starts coming down after uh, C9 or so. So um, what uh, Ilya and Berendt did is they used the Gibbs ensemble to compute the vapor liquid phase behavior at subcritical temperatures. I should have mentioned that the Gibbs ensemble uh, relies on uh, the cost of having an interface to prevent the two boxes from being mixed. Near a critical point, that's no longer true. So you can really get to the critical point with the Gibbs ensemble, but you can get close enough so you can extrapolate and close, use the scaling conditions and locate approximately the critical point. So that's what uh, uh, Berend and Ilya did. And they showed unequivocally that the critical density of alkanes goes down as the uh, size is increased. And so one of the sets of experimental data wasn't uh, correct. And this was published in Nature in 1993. So that's great. Um, to get quantitative agreement with broad set of experimental data, we needed to do a lot more work. Or fortunately, uh, again, a lot of different groups put the effort to develop force fields that quantitatively represent the phase behavior of a wide variety of different systems. This is a classic example from the work of Ilya Sipman and his group in the late 90s, showing that um, some of the popular force fields at the time, this is a molecular modeling force field for alkanes, were really terrible in terms of the vapor liquid equilibrium. They were not developed with knowledge of the vapor liquid phase behavior. So when you test them, you find they're really no good. OPLS, which had uh, better uh, parameterization, even though it didn't directly um, take into account the vapor liquid phase behavior is much better. And then Ilya Sipman and his group developed a whole series of uh, force fields called TRAP, transferable potentials for phase equilibria. This is just an example paper number seven in the series published in the early 2000s on amines. And you can see what the um, force fields look like. They have united atom or explicit hydrogen models. This is the pseudo atom with a size parameter, Leonard Jones, an epsilon parameter, depth, and the partial charge when appropriate for amines or amides or other groups. So this is, uh, this is what has made the, a big difference in the quality of the force fields for liquids that we use nowadays. Um, my own involvement with the Gibbs ensemble, I should say, I, I hope I made it clear that the configurational bias and force field developments were not done by me. Uh, they were done in, in different groups. I wasn't working on that very much. What um, had caught my attention in the, in the early 1990s was ionic systems. And uh, this was 
uh, or electrolyte melts. Uh, this was a problem suggested to me by George Stell and uh, Michael Fisher, and a problem on which I worked quite a bit in the early to mid 1990s, and then even subsequently um, uh, from that after I, I, I moved. So this is a, um, a, a um, phase behavior, temperature versus density, this time in logarithmic scale for the density for a classic model for ionic melts or crystals uh, called the restricted primitive model, which is just hard spheres, same diameter, opposite charges, positive and negative. This was a uh, model of, of great theoretical interest. There were some uh, theoretical calculations by George Stell up here, predicting a phase envelope and a critical point. And uh, we, uh, I had a, a PhD student by the name of Gerasimus Orkulas, who was at Cornell with me, and we did a series of calculations. And there were some other theoretical calculations by uh, John Vallot uh, here using density scaling Monte Carlo. Um, and all of our calculations predicted a lower critical density for this, a uh, critical temperature for the restricted primitive model around 0.05. Um, these different points are Gibbs ensemble with single particle insertions with neutralizing backgrounds, the open circles or the triangles biased pair transfers, some other Gibbs ensemble calculation by Cayo around the same time. And uh, I think this started establishing the true phase behavior of the RPM around that time. And I'm, I'm sorry to say that this was the last uh, real big paper I did using the Gibbs ensemble. So this is mid 1990s. Uh, since that time, I have not really done very much with the Gibbs ensemble. And I, I hear all the time, especially Ilya Sipman, who, who has, who is a great fan of that, keeps asking me, why haven't you used it? Well, it, it turns out I was uh, doing, uh, I was getting interested in critical points and, and systems for which it is not necessarily true that the Gibbs ensemble is the best method to, to use. So, uh, however, there is still a lot, of, a lot of interest and usefulness in the method. And uh, I'm just going to show a couple of examples. Um, in, uh, in the early 2000s, uh, Peter Cummings and, and uh, uh, collaborators, Ariel Chalvo and Patrice Parico, came up with uh, what for the time was the most accurate polarizable model for water. Uh, it's a Gaussian charge polarizable model. And because it's polarizable, it's a lot more expensive than uh, uh, for the time, especially relative to fixed point charge models. So they use Gibbs ensemble to get the phase behavior, density versus temperature rotated by 90 degrees and vapor pressure and demonstrate that uh, actually they use that information to optimize the parameters for the uh, Gaussian charge model GCPM that they came up with. That's one classic example. Um, another example, I mentioned that briefly at the beginning, this is actually only a couple of years old. People doing ab initio density functional theory, um, quantum mechanical density functional theory calculations of phase behavior for different models, different uh, functionals, BLYP D3 and BPE D3, these are quantum mechanical density functionals. And because they are quantum mechanical, the cost of doing an energy calculation for a given configuration is very high. So for these cases, you really want to use as small a system as possible. This study was done with 64 CO2 molecules or SO2 molecules and get the Gibbs ensemble to get you the estimates of the vapor liquid uh, um, densities, blue points and red points are different functionals for CO2 and SO2, and then estimate critical points by extrapolating the subcritical information to the critical point. And of course you get the vapor pressures as well. Um, I, uh, I'm always curious to see what other systems people are using the uh, method for, and I'm uh, collecting uh, bibliographic information. This is the uh, world of, of science or science citation index 
uh, citations to the first Gibbs Ensemble paper. Um, as you can see, the, the citations, of course, started in 1987, uh, grew fairly significantly, and are fairly steady, um, maybe even uh, going down a little bit at 50, 60 a year. So these are people who reference the original paper, not all of them using the Gibbs Ensemble, maybe some say uh, uh, historic methods for phase equilibria include the Gibbs Ensemble, and so on and so forth. Um, so what are the alternatives, in my view, to the Gibbs Ensemble for phase behavior? And when are they useful? And when are they um, more accurate, perhaps, or recommended against Gibbs Ensemble? Um, one, I'm, I'm just going to mention a few, there are many. Um, one very simple, straightforward is interfacial simulations. Just put in an elongated box, a liquid next to vapor and measure the properties. You can do also for two liquids. You can do it even for solids, which are not an area that the Gibbs ensemble can apply to. Um, put a solid crystal at equilibrium with solution and see what, what you get. What is the equilibrium solubility? These require very long simulations relative to the early days, but very feasible now with the modern computing power that we have. Uh, we can always resort to thermodynamic res resort to thermodynamic integration to calculate chemical potentials or some other method to calculate chemical potentials, especially if you have very low solubilities for which the Gibbs ensemble is not really practical and interfacial simulations will not be practical because the concentration of one component in one of the phases is very low. One of my favorite methods, one I've used very extensively since the mid nineties is Grand Canonical Monte Carlo with histogrammic weighting. And I'll explain that in a little more detail in the next few slides. And the reason I enjoy using that is I'm interested in universality classes. There was a long standing question. What is the universality class of the restricted primitive model? Is it really three dimensional Ising or is it a different universality class? We cannot answer those questions using the Gibbs ensemble or interfacial simulations. We need to get to the critical point itself. And then of course, a, a, um, since the 2000s and so on, there have been a real explosion of different ensembles, expanded, multi-thermal, multi-baric, transition matrix. And I will not really talk too much about them, but there are really a lot more sophisticated methods than simple Grand Canonical Monte Carlo with histogram weighting that I'll explain briefly. So what is Grand Canonical Monte Carlo? It relies on insertion and removal of particles, but now in a single box. So you are setting the chemical potential volume and temperature, and you're observing what happens in your simulation box as a function of the configurations generated. So for a simple system, this is a Leonard Jones system, you may get a histogram that looks like this. So the number of abbreviations of n particles in the box um, collected over the course of the simulation. In a single phase system, this will look like roughly Gaussian, although not quite Gaussian because of the small system size. The beauty of this is that you can take this histogram and this is F of N versus N and through a very simple statistical mechanical transformation, the logarithm of that minus beta mu n is the log of q, the partition function within an additive constant. So you get little pieces of the partition function for the range of densities that you have sampled in each simulation for each different chemical potential. And then you put them together because this constant is different, you don't know it. And you create a composite curve valid for all densities from chemical potential one and chemical potential two. And then the beauty of that is that there is a very well-defined theory, finite size scaling theory of how these distributions behave near critical points. It doesn't matter, this is a polymer system at a certain temperature in a box of size 20. The probability distribution of the number of particles in the box is like this. So you may say, oh, it's a two-phase system. Well, it turns out that's not quite true. 
and you can see why it's not true if you change the system size from 20 to 30. You find that this distribution changes. Of course, N goes up because you have a bigger box, but also you start losing this two peak shape. Eventually, if you go to an even bigger box, this becomes a single Gaussian. You are above the critical point. If you're below the critical point, this is the probability distribution you get at 9.6 in a small box. And then if you go to a bigger box, the phases separate out and you clearly see that there are two different phases of the corresponding densities. At the critical point, you have a magic curve, a universal curve that you can compute using the three-dimensional Ising model or any model that you like for which you can get high quality results. This is the red curve here. And your simulations, my simulations or anybody can map to that universal Ising curve and get you the critical parameters to very high accuracy. They are slightly system size dependent. So 9.92 and 9.90 in the two different system sizes I showed you before. And this is all uh, done uh, starting with Kurt Binder and his, his uh, finite size scaling theories. And then this particular version was implemented by Bruce and Walding in the 1990s. So when you're interested in critical points, this is a very good method to use and it's still very actively used uh, today. Um, this method can also be used to construct phase diagrams below the critical point. You are sampling with histograms. Let's say you have a athermal system where the basic parameters are the two component particle numbers. And then you sample near the critical point and then you sample histograms below the critical point and you connect them through, through the critical point and construct the time tie lines. We use this method to calculate fluid phase behavior in colloid polymer systems um, in, in, in a paper we wrote a few years back in the early 2000s, uh, where getting these um, critical points and the tie lines below the critical point is very hard unless you do something like this, calculating critical points uh, through a uh, finite size scale. Um, now, the, um, the other method that I talked about is, well, let's, let me uh, just say one more thing, and that is the same method, finite size scaling and reweighting to get below the critical point can be used for real systems. This is CO2 and water at high temperatures. This is some work we did with uh, our joint student with Pablo de Benedetti and myself uh, for high temperature, high pressure, CO2 water phase behavior. Experimental points are the black points and simulation with different models are in colored uh, symbols, they are not in perfect agreement to experiments because the force fields are not perfect. We need better force fields. So that's one class of methods. I'm going to switch to interfacial methods. Um, for the same model, now, if you think about adding salt to these phases, it becomes very difficult to do histograms or gun canonical. Uh, you could do Gibbs ensemble, but you have to assume that one of the phases does not contain any salt. But you can also do nowadays interfacial simulations. So this is CO2 water, the two liquids up here, and the bottom panel just isolates salt that is present essentially all in the liquid phase. So this is a relatively large system and you need a lot of time to get it to equilibrate. But once you do that, you can read off the coexisting compositions for the mixture, this is the water phase, this is the um, CO2 phase, and uh, get uh, not only the coexistence properties, but also the surface tension. And that is shown here um, from a study a few years ago with, uh, with an undergraduate student uh, in, uh, here at Princeton and a graduate student of mine, Mike Howard, where we studied very carefully the phase and interfacial behavior of Leonard Jones chains. So as a function of length. So this parameter M is four to 60 and you set up very carefully and controlled way and long simulations, the two phases 
uh, liquid and vapor, and you read off the coexisting densities, you can get fairly near the critical point and extrapolate to the critical point. And moreover, something the Gibbs ensemble cannot give you is the surface tension between the two phases as a function of temperature. And you can see we are trying to get scaling laws and that work reasonably well. Um, I, should, I mentioned very briefly solids, which is not applicable. Gibbs ensemble is not applicable to them. But I also want to point out, this is not my work. This is work of Jose Alexandre, Alejandre, uh, setting up simulations with a crystal and water and letting it go to equilibrium involves microsecond molecular dynamic simulations. And you can see that depending on how you set up the system, you get quite different results, uh, which converge to roughly the same value only over microsecond long time scales. So this would be very expensive and practical in the old days. The other area I want to very briefly mention is, is integration, uh, thermodynamic integration, which is a very general method. And I'll give one example um, where we used widow type insertions of additional beads in a system to calculate the chemical potential of hydrocarbons in water. And this is work done, uh, well, the incremental widow method is a collaboration with uh, Sanat Kumar and Nicholas Slifer. And this particular work uh, I'm showing here is with Andy Ferguson, who is now in Chicago, and Pablo de Vendetti and myself, a similar type of question to the one that was asked by uh, Sipman, Caraborni, and Smith. We have experimental data for the solubility of alkanes in water, and they don't agree. So this point here, the brown points are different and quite uh, two orders of magnitude different than other sets of experimental points. The simulations show that this solubility should really go down exponentially with carbon number. And most of the experimental measurements, which are very challenging because of the very low solubilities, are incorrect. So just to summarize, as I'm getting close to the end, my view at the moment is that if you just do a comparison on the basis of how many compute cycles you need to do a calculation of a certain accuracy, and you do VLE of relatively simple systems not too close to the critical point, you can do Gibbs ensemble, or you can do um, interfacial calculations. The interfacial calculations will be much slower, but they give you roughly comparable information. If you only restrict it to small systems, Gibbs ensemble is a very good choice. For critical parameters, you need to use other methods, grand canonical, finite size scaling. Thermodynamic integration, very good for very low solubilities or for special cases like electrolyte activities. And if you need the surface tension, you can only do interfacial molecular dynamics. However, I should say that a more relevant metric may be not how many compute type cycles you need, but how much time will it take for your graduate student or postdoc to get a calculation done. And in that, I think it's very difficult nowadays to compete against the very fast, highly optimized parallel and general uh, open source molecular dynamics codes like Lanch or Gromax. So um, it may be a good time to talk about the history because I think this is, this is really becoming uh, different as we go uh, moving forward. I want to just uh, close or get near close by acknowledging uh, some students and postdocs that uh, helped me or, or worked and created the work I presented uh, in some of the slides. I will not read all the names, they are here. Also collaborators, including Dominic, uh, and funding from DOE, who has been very good to me over many years, and NSF and uh, smaller sources. And I want to close uh, in, the, in the spirit of being an informal talk uh, with a picture from a uh, Foundations of Molecular Modeling and Simulation uh, uh, conference in Colorado. And, and uh, this is yours truly. This is uh, Juan de Pablo, Baron Smith, uh, Peter Cummings, uh, Stan Sandler, um, S. Ingulari, and, 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 and a few others uh, in, in the, on the boat. And I, do, I did promise people to show something about Marvel. I was delighted to see Marvel is sponsoring that. 
I have dealt with a company called Marvel, and this is their logo, and this is their, um, their, their statement. Uh, he who commands the sea has command of everything. And I, can, I hope you can imagine what they make. They make boats, and this is me. You can't tell, that's good, uh, with a Marvel boat exploring liquid favor, uh, phase equilibria of, of uh, seawater. So with that, I will stop here. And I will be delighted to answer any questions if there is any time left. It took me a little longer than I hoped, so there isn't too much time. Thank you. Thank you, Thanos. And don't worry, I mean, there's always time for questions, in particular at Seacam and Marvel events. So um, I'm very much looking forward to seeing a few of those popping up in the Q&A uh, interface. We can start from uh, Papchenko who thanks you very much for this inspiring and insightful talk and uh, would like to ask if you have any suggestions on the program available, uh, including the reliability uh, for Monte Carlo, both for Gibbs and Grand Canonical in polymers. So I think we're kind of talking about computer um, codes here. So I, uh, there are some wonderful codes uh, maintained uh, openly uh, by uh, Ilya Sipman and then, uh, uh, Ed McGinn has some uh, great, uh, great codes uh, that do Monte Carlo and do uh, Gibson sample simulations. Ed McGinn is in, uh, in Notre Dame. Um, and also my, uh, my uh, former student, um, Jeff Podolf maintains and runs. He was a postdoc with uh, Elias Sigmund. Uh, so these, are, these would be my, my recommendations. Um, one, one of the codes is called Cassandra, the one by Ed McKean, and uh, codes uh, uh, by uh, Ilya uh, are called Tauhe, T-O-W-H-E-E. -E. Okay, thank you. Um, keeping on, you know, the relationship between new algorithms and codes, I was just curious, you mentioned a few times that thanks to your Gibson sample, there would be uh, you know, you could repeat, you could perform calculations much, much faster than what you had to do in your uh, PhD thesis experience. I was just wondering if you could quantify that. Um, in for a, a typical two-component Leonard Jones system uh, that I did both for my PhD thesis and and for my uh, using the Gibson ensemble, the uh, uh, compute computing time requirement was. Uh, roughly two orders of magnitude faster with the Gibson ensemble. Yeah, that's that's cool. I, I mean, I, I keep telling Factor my of thirty, you... roughly something like that. Yeah, it's, it's it's. But that depends strongly on the on 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 the system that you have. Mm -hmm. But still, you know, I, I keep telling my students that good ideas are still more important than fast computers, and it's good to, to remind ourselves of this from time to time. So we have a question from uh, Raymond Christopher Amador. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Do your studies on interfaces using the Gibbs ensemble still show the variance in total energy of the system in question being proportional to the square of the temperature? Uh, the variance in total energy. So. You, uh, I presume we're talking about fluctuations uh, in, in, in and, and this will, I, I haven't really looked at the specific effect of the um, uh, Gibbs ensemble or, or, or on the energy fluctuations. I think the, the, you expect eventually the limit at the limit of larger systems, this will go to the canonical ensemble as shown by Baron Smith and, and uh, Dan Frankel, so I would expect those to be consistent, but I haven't personally studied that specific question. Okay. Um, I don't see any more questions. Uh, Raymond, thanks you for, for the answer, of course. Um, are there questions from our, our other panelists? If not, I am sure that yeah, if, if I may ask, I mean, this is more about the final comment you made about uh, yeah, the, the existence of uh, MD, uh, powerful codes like lamps. Uh, just you were talking about looking to the past and looking to the future. How, how do you see then the balance between this type of Monte Carlo code for which there something similar doesn't exist and the exploitation of direct MD codes? How, 
what would be your forecast for the use of these methods in, in the years to come? Um, you know, I've, I've uh, most of my um, career has been with Monte Carlo, um, but it is difficult to produce high quality parallelizable um, portable code with Monte Carlo. It is, it is possible, and in some cases it is necessary. Uh, my, my good friend uh, Doros Theodoro, for example, uh, has these wonderful moves on polymers where you, you, know, you chop and, and, and regrow and, and do things that you could never do with molecular dynamics. But for many systems, the, 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 the molecular dynamics engines are really expected to do something very focused. You know, you calculate forces and you move the system forward, you integrate equations of motion, and that can be done very nicely in parallel. And so, because there's been so much development, a lot more development of the codes, they are in very good shape at the moment. And I, I think the relative advantage will only grow with time uh, relative to the available Monte Carlo codes. I see a question by Patrick Warren. Indeed. In phase coexistence involving charge systems, what happens if you want to have the dielectric permittivity dependent on the composition? Is it if is this even allowed, by the way, or should you always have to use explicitly polar polarizable molecules to represent polar solvents, for example? And thank you for the talk. Great. Um, so the, the dielectric permittivity in systems where you have explicit atomistic models, like the ones I was showing the simulations of uh, CO2 and water and sodium chloride, the dielectric permittivity you put in the calculations is a vacuum because the, the fluctuations of the charge are in the system. You don't need to have to know what is the permittivity and how it depends on, on, on composition. Now, if you have a, an implicit solvent or other model where you need to enter the permittivity manually, then it will become an issue how you do that properly. Um, and how you take into account composition variations. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure if that covers uh, the question completely, uh, but uh, it will be quite difficult to do that unless you have access to explicit calculations of the permittivity as a function of composition. Got you. We'll see if Patrick has a, has a follow up on this on the Q&A. In the meantime, there is another question by Pierre Kavak. Do you think computing power improvements in the future will yield two order of magnitude speed up to current simulation times? Thank you for the awesome talk. Uh, the answer is uh, yes, I believe so. I mean, there's, uh, there's been no breakdown thus far to the uh, expectation that we see faster computers every time. Of course, they tend to be faster because they have more processors these days, which means parallelization becomes more and more important. I think what is more likely to happen is that instead of using simple models, we will be using models that are a lot more expensive, um, perhaps machine learning based on ab initio calculations, which would eat up any additional uh, speed up that we get uh, in computing power by making calculations that are much more realistic and allow you to take into account, for example, chemistry. So uh, that's my, my response. Okay. Oh, uh, one last question by Rose Chernovsky, and then we'll, we'll go to the break. Um, as computing power improves, what problems do you think will be accessible that will accessible that, will, that weren't pre previously? So I alluded to that. That's a great question. Thank you, Rose. Um, I think that problems where you take into account explicitly reactions or quantum mechanical effects are going to be important and are going to be allowed by the increase in computing power. Okay, on, on that note, I think uh, we should stop here for a short break. We are running about 10 minutes late. That's not bad for CK and Marvel uh, event traditions. So um, I suggest that we still take 10 minutes uh, for, for a coffee or just to, to relax for a little bit. And we uh, meet each other uh, again here online at 16.20 uh, Lausanne time. So in 10 minutes. 
See you thank soon. you so much. Thank I will, you, Tanner. Uh, I will uh, turn off my video, correct? Yes, thank you. Bye. Um, welcome back to the second part of our Sika Marvels Classic dedicated to simulations of fluid phase equilibria. So um, I see in the Q&A chat that there are a couple of uh, follow-ups to Thanos' talk. I would, however, suggest that we now move to the next item on our program, which is Dominic Tisley's talk on molecular simulation of fluid phase equilibria, multi-component mixtures and pores. There will be time to go back to these questions um, in, in the very last part of our conversation today. So I think in the interest of just moving along with the, with the program, I would ask Patrick and uh, Mahmoud to be patient and, and wait for, uh, for a few more minutes before they get their time uh, and their question answered. So it is now my pleasure to give the floor to Dominic Tisley. Dominic, please share your screen and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah, and thank you, uh, Thanos, for a wonderful talk. Uh, I want to just share some uh, early recollections of the, of the Gibbs uh, simulation method for me. I was editing molecular physics, which was a wonderful job, and I did that for four years from 1986 to 1992. And right at the beginning, I remember it was one really rather cold Monday morning uh, in Southampton. We were based in a small hut which has now disappeared and which is now the new chemistry tower. But at the time, I used to get many papers coming in, particularly on a Monday morning. And here's a huge pile of them uh, on the desk in front of me. And they were all very worthy. Uh, some of them were more interesting than, than others. But in this pile, there was a diamond. And that was the paper from Thanassus, which arrived from, from Oxford. Uh, and uh, when I opened it and, and I read it through myself because I was really interested in the subject, I thought this is going to make a, a really significant difference to the field. And I think that has shown to be the case. Uh, we were um, at that time working in the same way that Phanassus had been working on looking at phase equilibria. We had chosen to look at a, a diatomic Leonard Jones mixture uh, modeling carbon dioxide and uh, ethane, they wanted to look at the, the positive azeotrope that this system was supposed to exhibit. And I'd done some work with Nick Quirk and David Fincham. We'd used the DAP computer at Queen Mary College in London, which was a very early version uh, of a, a, a single instruction multiple data machine. And we must have performed 60 simulations. Each one of these simulations probably took us about two days uh, on the machine. So we used a very significant portion of that machine and we were constantly trying to lower the error in the calculation of the chemical potential by particle insertion in order to construct the phase diagram. Well, I think we managed to get uh, somewhere along those lines, um, but um, really it was not the way to go. And so you can imagine my delight when I opened this little diamond of a paper uh, from Oxford, uh, where there was an, an, now an opportunity to uh, take the, the method which we knew worked well for configurational properties, but completely avoid the calculation of the chemical potential and free energy directly, which was always going to be a difficult thing to do with, with Metropolis Monte Carlo, and to head straight for a picture of the phase diagram. So as Fernandez has already mentioned, we had uh, a wonderful visit from him. He came down to spend a day with us in, uh, in Southampton. Uh, we spent all day discussing mixtures, membrane equilibria, the possibility for performing Gibbs ensemble calculations at constant pressure, as well as constant volume. And uh, once we'd established this, we set off to produce this uh, second paper, which appeared in 1998. A great deal of credit for that must go to Mike Stapleton. I've shown you a little picture of Mike uh, over here. This was not the way Mike looked in uh, 1998. He was much more of a student in those days. But I have some photographs from that time. I'm just not allowed to show them. And since he has some photographs of me, I won't show them because it's a question of mutually assured destruction if we exchange photographs. 
Uh, he then went on uh, at the end of his third year to, to go out early before he'd taken his fiver to work in, uh, uh, in Cornell with, uh, with uh, Thanasis. And uh, we worked on the use of uh, Gibbs ensemble methods to perform simulations of quadrupolar fluids. In particular, we looked at molecules where one molecule had a, a positive quadrupole plus one and the other molecule a negative quadrupole in order to model systems like uh, CO2 uh, acetylene. This was something which was dear to my heart because I had tried as a graduate student to use non-spherical perturbation theory for liquid state to predict these phase diagrams, but failed miserably. And it was a great pleasure to see how easily these simulations really fell out for us in the early days. So the method, which had been full of promise, I think really in its first year or so, lived up strongly to that promise. Um, I think since those very early days, I, I've been looking on the web of science. I've not read them all, but I've, I've been through, there are about 1,256 papers on the Gibbs Ensemble method, which have been published since that date. And uh, there are many people here who have made very significant contributions. I'm only gonna really be able to talk about three types of calculation. And so I'm going to offend 253 people, but nevertheless, I just want to press on. And I want to begin by talking about some work uh, which was performed by uh, a postdoc who came to work with me when I was at Imperial College, Jose Nuno Canogia Lopez, or uh, Z Nuno as he's known to his friends, who had worked with uh, George Calado at the Technical Institute in Lisbon and was an expert on phase diagrams and particularly their measurement of them. And we decided in the early days that we would try to simulate uh, more than two component systems. Um, so three component systems, possibly two, possibly three, maybe even four phases. And to show you a simple example here from a paper published in 1997, uh, here we're simulating a very symmetrical mixture. T is one uh, in Leonard-Jones units, P 0.06, which is roughly orthobaric, and all of the diameters of the three species, A, B, and C, are the same. Uh, the uh, interactions between A, B, 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 and C, C are the same. The only thing is that I've lowered the interactions, the crossed interactions, A, B, B, C, and A, C particles. So to make them, if you like, slightly more repulsive. And we have this wonderfully exciting uh, phase diagram, which comes from the simulation of three Gibbs simulation boxes together. We simply need to make a choice of any two boxes at any one time to exchange particles between those two boxes, to do volume moves between those boxes. And then we can continue doing Monte Carlo moves in each of the boxes separately. And we could, of course, if we wish to use molecular dynamics to, to do precisely that. And what happens in these cases is we have this very beautiful situation. If you take down the, the, the phase diagram has to be completely symmetrical because of the symmetry in the parameters here. But if you take, uh, uh, you get a, a, a three phase region here, two liquid phases are here and here in coexistence with a, a gas phase in second. And as you add more C to the mixture, moving up towards the C apex, there's never enough C to form a, a, a these parameters, this parameter set, there's never enough C to form a separate liquid phase. But C enters both of the two liquid phases and the gas phase, and eventually, causes the uh, two liquid phases to mix. So we move into this region uh, here, which is a two phase region, not a three phase region. Now, what will happen in the Gibbs simulation boxes is the two of these boxes will become the same. One now has to keep a careful eye on things because under those circumstances, one of the boxes can become very long and very thin. Once it reaches the size of the cutoff in the chemical potential, it's best to stop and to reduce the number of boxes uh, down to two. But as I say, we can simulate these three phase mixtures. Now the, the phase rule tells us that um, for a system with three components um, and uh, one degree of freedom, one line we can move along in the simulation, we should in fact be able to simulate four phases. And uh, I want to show you what happens. I'm just going to make a single change to one parameter, a very small change, I'm going to reduce the cross interaction from epsilon 0.7 to 0.6. And uh, the first thing you can see is there's a dramatic and interesting change in the phase diagram. And this comes about because uh, we're now simulating in four boxes. 
we have three possible liquid phases. In each of the corners of the triangular phase diagram here, we have a phase which is really rich, say, in liquid A. It's a two-phase region. It will also contain a, a, another liquid phase with some A, B, and C. So this is the, this is the two-phase region here. And then right in the middle of the diagram now, we have this extensive uh, three-phase region. And because uh, we're simulating in four boxes, we also have a line here, a dashed line, which we can move along effectively and simulate the four phases in coexistence with one another. So we can simulate more than one, two components. We can simulate three, possibly four components if we wish. And we can simulate more than one, two boxes. We can simulate three or four boxes, depending on the phase rule. And in these kind of situations, I think it's always best to try to start with a large number of boxes. And then when you see two of the boxes have become the same, effectively to stop the simulation at that point and move on to be looking at a, uh, at, at a lesser number of boxes. Now, these three component phase diagrams are all well, but I, I find them quite hard. What I want to do is to look at some two component mixtures. And this is a wonderful classification, initially by Bob Scott at UCLA and his student Van Kanijnenberg, in which they identify uh, six different types of uh, two phase interactions. So for a simple mixture here, like um, uh, methane and propane, we have the two liquid vapor lines. These are for the pure fluids. We simulated a 50-50 mixture, the line would run up the middle and cross this red line, which is the line of critical points, liquid vapor critical points. We switch to another type of system, CO2 octane. Then it's uh, absolutely possible to simulate uh, with a liquid-liquid phase here. So we would need to be using three Gibbs simulation boxes at this point. We have a liquid-liquid critical point, which goes off steeply to join the liquid-solid uh, coexistence line. And we still have this liquid gas uh, line of critical points. If we move uh, to the next situation, uh, which is a type three uh, situation, typical for hydrocarbons and water, we have an even more interesting, we have a liquid vapor A line, we have a liquid vapor B line, and we still have this liquid one, liquid two vapor line. This is a raw surface which projects onto the PT plane as a single line. But now we have different critical points. We have this line ending in a liquid vapor critical point, liquid vapor critical line up here. But here, the liquid liquid line no longer is the merging of two liquids, but it's the, the liquid one phase becomes identical to the phase containing the vapor and liquid. I won't go through all of these, but just to say down here at the very end, we have a type six phase diagram in which we have a so-called dome of immiscibility. In other words, the liquid-liquid line here is closed, and we have a, a unique portion of liquid-liquid vapor three-phase coexistence with an upper critical solution point and a lower critical solution point. You have to understand that this was a very important um, figure in my younger days. No Gordon Conference would have been complete. In fact, it was like the national anthem at the Gordon Conference. This particular figure had to be showed. And once this figure had been shown at, 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 at holding a school at the Liquids Gordon Conference, the aficionados of the critical point would uh, applaud. And then we could proceed with looking at the other points on the face diagram. But this was an extremely important type of, uh, of diagram. And as I say, one which I've come to admire more as I've got older, I think this is a wonderful piece of work and has lasted 40 years. There are a number of possible sub uh, subgroupings, but mainly these six uh, classifications have remained intact. I just wanted to show you a little photograph here. Uh, this is not from a Gordon conference, but from a conference in the physical chemistry laboratory. I've entitled it's the mighty waters of the liquid state. And here we have Ben Widham and, and John Rowlandson and Keith Gubbins uh, with Joel Ebovitz on one side and uh, Bob Evans on the other. And Annika Lavelt Singer, a wonderful experimentalist and theoretician on this end. Uh, Max McGlashan and Bob Thomas. Uh, this is Douglas Everett, uh, John Pierre Hansen. I think this is Walter Stockmeyer, and I know that this is Henderson, uh, Barker and Henderson, John Henderson and Doug Barker. Now, when well, these people were gathered together for the photograph, there were two empty seats. And so Frank von Sfall and I were commissioned to join. We were handed ties and told to look respectable. 
But I wanted to show you this photograph because I particularly want just to highlight uh, uh, Bob Scott and, and, and this wonderful piece of work that he did with his student. I want to go on to show you that that phase diagram can be tackled by looking, by using the Gibbs uh, simulation method. Here again is a very simple uh, intermolecular potential, Leonard Jones potential, all the sigma parameters are one, and the epsilon parameters kind of obey the Lawrence Berthelot mixing rule. So this is a, a fairly classic mixture. And we're going to simulate here in the Gibbs ensemble at an overall mole fraction of 0.5. That won't be the mole fraction in the phases, but that's the overall mole fraction that you feed in, certainly for this curve. And you can see at that mole fraction, you get a line, a pressure line, which is in between the two pure components and which crosses. So at this point, the two phases, this is a two phase Gibbs simulation, simply merge into one. Uh, and it's exactly the same when you look at the components in the, uh, the mole fractions of A in the, in the liquid and, and in the vapor. Uh, again, uh, this can be done uh, just by scanning up in temperature. And again, you get a similar curve for a type one behavior at, um, at a, uh, for the density as a function of temperature. This is the kind of behavior you really see here where you get uh, two simulation boxes which are really quite close to one, which are fluctuating, which in the end turn out to be above your estimated critical point. And then finally, you can't do this at one temperature, but you have to do a series of uh, mole fractions at, at a particular temperature in order to get the, the, uh, the mole fractions as a function of pressure. And this was work that uh, Zinuno did when he returned to, to Portugal, published in in uh, 1999, and it's a wonderful little example of how you can simulate a type one phase diagram. I won't go through all of them, but let's just look at what would happen if you tried to simulate a type two phase diagram, uh, for type six phase diagram. Now, this is a very interesting type of liquid because using the original theory that uh, Scott and Van Kanijnenberg used, which was Van der Waals one fluid theory, it's quite difficult to predict this type of mixture from it, but they are observed experimentally. And in the Gibbs simulation, simply lowering the cross diameter to 0.85 in the mixture and simply lowering the epsilon value to 0.820, we can perform simulations where we now have the pure liquids lines here with a gas liquid critical point, which we can kind of identify. We have the liquid liquid uh, behavior along this line, <laughs> critical points which are uh, uh, suggestion of, of, of a no. But now let's look at this particular section. So we would perform a simulation at this temperature around about 0.8 and we would be using three boxes but two of the boxes would be very close to one another. So we've got a liquid, one liquid vapor equilibrium here. Now as we move up a little bit in temperature, so we're going to move up to about one, we get right into the middle of this region where now we have a separation between two liquid, two liquid phases with this uh, mole fraction of XA and a vapor phase with this mole fraction, YA. And uh, you can see this is right in the middle of a three phase region. Here we're using a three phase box. And once again, as we increase the temperature up, and now we're going to simulate at about 1.2, we go back to forming the, uh, the two phases. And again, we, we see uh, in those three phases, two of the boxes will become identical again. This behavior down here at low temperatures, uh, the reemergence of a single equilibrium between a vapor and a single liquid mixture is associated with some quite interesting structuring, which is occurring in the liquid phase. And if we go on to look at the density, here we can see the, the projection of the dome emissibility onto the density uh, temperature surface. And this is the region of the two phase emissibility. These are the two liquid phase densities in, in coexistence with the gas phase densities. And uh, in the experiment, of course, depending on which of these two liquid phases is the heaviest, they will slide down the side of the test tube and form a phase in between the first liquid phase and the second liquid phase. This is not something we have to worry about too much in the simulation. So, it's possible using Gibbs methods to simulate all six types of binary phase diagrams. And this can be done, I think, fairly straightforwardly. As Vanassas has already mentioned, critical lines and points 
cannot be defined precisely through this method, but they can be inferred to quite a significant accuracy by multiple simulations on either side of the phase boundaries and increase in the case of the critical points by, by scaling. But what I want to point out to, and I think this is important, is this method, I believe, is readily extendable to more complex intermolecular potentials. I've shown you the richness in the phase diagrams for the simplest of systems here. But if we switch to molecular systems or using configurational bias, a la Ilya Seatman and the co-workers, we can extend this to more complicated intermolecular potentials and essentially to more phases. And I think there's real scope here. I believe there's real scope here for creating a Monte Carlo package, which will enable us to perform simulations routinely in many, of many components uh, and, and look for, for phase, phase behavior before uh, we begin to uh, really pin it down, perhaps experimentally. I want to go on now just to mention a piece of work which I haven't been involved in, but which I like very much, which is about phase equilibrium in uh, poorer systems. And this is work done by, by Brennan, and published in 2003. And essentially, as Thanasis has already told you, the, the Gibbs simulation method uh, is, is a wonderful technique because um, it enables you to simulate um, in pores. But the pores that Thanasis described are fairly regular. They're often flat parallel plates or they're often cylindrical pores. But I think the novel thing that the Brennan was able to achieve here was by simulating in uh, a, a, an irregular pore structure. So the first thing that they do in this, in this work is to fill the box with an irregular pore structure of hard spheres. Now I say fill the box uh, loosely because in order to get these simulations to work, you have to be working at quite a low uh, volume fraction down at 0.1, 0.2. And they talk about the porosity and the porosity here is uh, in fact minus, uh, minus one, the, uh, the packing fraction. So porosities of 0 0.9, 0 0.95, 1.0, in order to get any kind of phase coexistence <coughs> in these irregular structures. Then inside, so you perform a Monte Carlo simulation to give you the, uh, the structure of the, of, of the hard sphere pore. And then inside that, using a smaller box, you, you set up your liquid mixture. Now, this kind of liquid mixture inside an irregular pore is really difficult to study experimentally and really quite difficult to study by, by, by uh, paper and pen theory, as it were. So that the simulation plays a really critical role here. You choose the smaller periodic cube so that during the volume fluctuations, which will occur in the Gibbs ensemble, that smaller cube is never going to go outside the size of the larger hard sphere cube, which you start. So you have to keep a careful eye on that during the course of the simulations. And then you begin to form, uh, I've just shown some volume rearrangements here, where you leave the irregular pore structure exactly as it is, but you scale the box structure up and down in order to equilibrate the pressure. I've shown just one box here. Of course, there's another box where precisely the opposite uh, volume scaling uh, is going on at the same time at the same external pressure. And so this enables us to simulate phase behavior in pores. Just to say again that the porosity here is in the region 0.95 to minus uh, 9.0. And uh, I want just to show you here uh, some very uh, lovely, what I think is a lovely result. So this again is for a very simple system. Again, how far you can get, we're just using a Leonard Jones potential, two components, all the same sizes. And the only thing you're going to do is to uh, reduce the effectively the, the epsilon 2,2 <coughs> parameter just to make the, 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 the make the 2,2 repulsion uh, slightly more significant. And the kind of um, volume fractions or if you like uh, porosities you're dealing with here are 0.975 and 0.95. And there's a review typical of uh, an aerogel. This is not one of my collaborators. This in fact is an aerogel over here. In, in, the, uh, in the top right hand corner. They're beautiful structures. I mean, you can make them from a gel, cooling, uh, drying them uh, uh, at really very low temperatures and drying them slowly. And a typical uh, gel of uh, uh, this uh, aerogel of this type, say weigh two kilograms, would happily, when dry, support the weight of two kilograms. And they have remarkable properties in terms of thermal conductivity. 
So these are the kind of structures that we're thinking about here. And again, let's have a quick look at this phase diagram. This is for the two component mixture, and we're looking at two different porosities. So the lower <coughs> porosity is the more open structure. 0.95, the red, is the, uh, is the, uh, is the, is the, uh, is the higher, um, uh, is the lower packing fraction, is the lower porosity and the higher packing fraction. So I'm sorry, 0.975 is the, is the more open structure. 0.95 is the slightly more closed uh, structure. And again, in the, the simulation, these are uh, lines which correspond to the, uh, the structure without any pore present. So this has been estimated, uh, but what we can show here clearly is the, the structure without any pore. And the first thing to note is that there is an enormous decrease. Uh, we're decreasing porosity, a significant reduction in the two phase regions. So that for the lowest porosity, the critical point observed during these simulations is reduced by approximately 50%. And the, although this is quite subtle, the, the strong interaction between species uh, one drives uh, species two slightly out of the pore. So this red line here, which is the liquid mole fraction, is slightly higher uh, at uh, the lower porosity or the higher uh, packing fraction. Species two is driven out of the pore. And of course, this is a purely energetic effect. This is not due to the size of the particles, which you can also investigate, by the way. But this is not due to the size of the particles, which are all the same. Now, I think this is a lovely piece of work. And it goes very well with another piece of work, another Monte Carlo simulation, a slightly different field by, by Keith Gubbins and, and co-workers in 2009. And he's looking at a detailed structural model for activated carbons from molecular simulation. And here he's using a technique called reverse Monte Carlo. So in other words, he's taking the diffraction pattern for the activated carbons and using Monte Carlo simulations of particles in order to match that particular diffraction pattern. And many different diffraction patterns of uh, particle structures will match the diffraction pattern. That's good. We have a whole ensemble of possible pore structures, irregular pore structures, and now we can simulate within those four structures, whatever we like. So I think, again, this is a method which is where, where, where we have the basics in place, but where I think there's plenty of scope for applications in the kind of uh, industrial landscape. And the third example, which I want to show you, uh, I'm slightly outside my comfort zone here, but I thought this was so nice, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to, to, to put it up. This is uh, an example of using the Gibbs simulation method to look at a quantum system by Fantonia Moroni, published in 2014. Very nice piece of work, I think. And uh, it's a path integral Monte Carlo calculation. Now, this isn't a weekly quantum mechanical system. This isn't look like adding a h bar squared expansion to the potential energy, or this is not like uh, having the uh, only quantum mechanical aspect of this in the internal or vibrational degrees of freedom of the problem. <coughs> this is really a fluid of bosons and a fluid which is quite capable of exhibiting superfluidity. So you can use path integral Monte Carlo calculations for bosons. I just remind you that a very nice analogy in path integral is that you start here with one particle, particle I, and you represent, the, the, this is a, a world line for particle i, if you like. Uh, you're moving along this in discrete intervals of time, inverted commas on and off, and uh, that represents the particle. The various uh, points along here uh, connected by harmonic springs determined by the quantum mechanical dispersion do represent the dispersion of the particle, and the same points on the same timeline interact with one another in, in different particles. So this is a rather unusual poly polymer. It's a, an analogy developed by Chandler and, and Willines. It's very beautiful, I think. Polymers do not intertangle, but nevertheless, they move around quite independently, uh, with each one of these actions being about one over K, the total interaction between the particles, because it's divided across each of the, uh, each of the polymer beads. So closed world lines can be represented as polymers interacting through a classical pair potential at the same time discretization. 
But in the truly boson fluid, we have this uh, symmetry of uh, being able to exchange particles. And so we have to look at permutation combinations. What this means in effect is that we might have a single polymer down here, which is being dispersed as it were quantum mechanically. But that dispersion in a particular permutation combination might extend over many, many particles. It might extend over two particles. It might extend over many particles. Now we can't include all of these permutations, the n factorial permutations, even of 64 particles in a particular simulation, but we can use the Monte Carlo method to sample these permutation uh, combinations. So the polymers now can expand the complete system, particularly close to the superfluid transition. And all interlinked trajectories of a permutation cycle of K particles form a single world line. All the world lines that are going to contribute to the partition function are closed. Now you can see that this makes a real difficulty for the Gibbs ensemble method. It might be possible in a weak system to have an exchange move where you took one of these quantum particles and deleted it in box one and created it in box two. But for a system which extends right across the box in one of these combinations, that's going to be very difficult. And this is, I think, the, the beautiful thing that uh, uh, they were able to accomplish, which was to use a, an algorithm called the world algorithm, uh, the worms algorithm. And, and this is done by snipping these closed um, world lines, and you can see them here, and creating uh, in, say, another box, an open world line. So the whole phase space of the system is extended to include worms. Uh, some of which are closed, and, and they're in the partition function sector or the Z sector, and some of which are open, and they only make a contribution to the one particle, Green's function. So now the simulation proceeds with some interesting local moves. In the Z sector, you can open and close the, uh, the closed world lines. Uh, and then in the G sector, you can insert and remove, so you can create a, uh, a polymer bead at this point, and then destroy it again at this point. And uh, you can advance and recede the polymer beads, or you can even swap in, in the G sector and, and the Z sector. So I don't have time to, to, to talk more detail about the, the, the Worms algorithm, but it's rather, I think, like the configurational bias uh, technique in, in, in tackling a real polymer problem. And we know that the Gibbs simulation method will tackle real polymers. There are over 80 papers in that field. So let's see what you can do. So again, this is work in two dimensions with 64 atoms. Uh, uh, and uh, you can see I've plotted out here in, in real units, the temperature, extremely low temperatures against the, uh, the two dimensional uh, uh, density, number density. And these are from Gibbs simulations using the worm algorithm. And on this side, we have a very low density liquid of uh, if you like, gas of, uh, of helium-4. And on this side, we have a superfluid liquid. And as I said before, we can even make an estimate, of quite a good estimate, of the critical temperature here using a kind of critical scaling method, uh, where um, A, uh, B, and C here will be uh, fittable parameters, and B0 uh, from theory is a half, and B1 is about an eighth. Is an eighth. And this gives us a, a critical density of 0.028 and a critical temperature of 0.90. So again, I think there are a whole range of quantum mechanical problems in two and three dimensions, which are now open to study by the, by the Gibbs simulation method. And that's something I look forward to seeing in the future. Um, in the um, next part of my talk, I just want to go on and kind of ask a question about, well, when the Gibbs simulation came along, did we abandon looking at direct interface simulations? And as has already told you that we, that we didn't. And in those days, as he's shown you, we were simulating droplets, which is of course the minimum free energy for a, for a, a set of molecules in, in a vacuum. But in periodic boundary conditions, this then becomes a, a, a fairly stable slab. We can measure from that slab the density profile and thus the two coexisting densities. And uh, that will fit very nicely to this kind of tanch function. And that will give us the coexistence curve. And we can even measure the structure in the fluid. Now, the structure in the fluid 
no longer just depends on the separation of the atoms, but also just not just the distance between them, but the height of the atoms in the surface and the direction in which the line between them moves away from the surface normal. So we can perform simulations in this particular, uh, particular way without difficulty. And I want to just mention my collaborator here, uh, Patrice Malfray, who I've worked with for many years at the University of Plenmore Ferrell. We've looked at a huge number of simulations of the gas liquid and liquid liquid interfaces, uh, particularly um, looking at the surface tension, which of course you can get out of these methods. And uh, much of this work is summarized, I think, in a nice review, which we wrote in 2016 in, in Chemical Society Reviews. What were some of the problems that we were facing back in 1986 when we thought about using this kind of method? Well, in those days, there was still quite a sharp debate about whether the interfaces, the average interfaces, were smooth or oscillatory. So um, Lee Barker and Pound and, and John Rollinson and Gustavo Chapella had come to different conclusions. I think it turns out that, that Gustavo Chapella and, and, and Rollinson were right here and that these surfaces basically, if you keep the center of mass of the slab in one place, are, 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 are monotonic. We also didn't really know and understand how to calculate the pressure in those days and did some work with uh, John Rollinson and others, but basically uh, Jim Henderson and and Peter Schofield showed that there were an endless number of different definitions of the microscopic pressure, all of which would lead to the same surface tension. So we now know how to calculate the pressure. We were worried about the size of the box, uh, L, X, L, Y in particular, how would capillary waves develop? How would they reflect in the, in the density profile? We were worried about the appropriate kinds of cutoff potentials to use. <coughs> the long range correction for the dispersion is an issue because it is no longer uniform. It can't be ignored and added at the end of the simulation because it's different depending on the height of a particular molecule at the center. So if particle one is in the interface, it's long range correction is going to be quite different from when it's right in the middle of the bulk fluid. And then we had to sort out long range electrostatic interactions. We now understand that basically we are simulating sandwiches of steam between two layers of water. Many of these sandwiches packed together and wrapped for lunch in tin foil. And when you do that kind of uh, calculation of electrostatic forces, you get an additional term now, which is dependent on the net dipole moment uh, in the Z direction uh, of the box. And then as the NASA has already told you, we, uh, we have to worry about the appropriate lengths of runs, which can be really quite long in order to get equilibrium situations. I'm going to start by showing you a success. And here I want to acknowledge, we've already seen his name before in, in Fernandez's talk, Jose Alejandre. Um, and uh, I had a lovely experience with Jose. I was working at a, uh, at, at a, a NATO summer school in Eriche in Sicily. And I was manning a poster and uh, Jose arrived and said that he thought it would be quite nice if we could work together. So I mumbled yes to that. And when I got back home in Southampton, I got a phone call on Saturday morning to say he'd moved into a guest house just uh, around the corner. And when were we gonna start work? And that was the beginning of a really fruitful and excellent uh, collaboration. And we studied water. Um, and uh, this is the, uh, the, the curve which is similar to that uh, of uh, uh, Peter Cummings that uh, Fanassis showed you earlier. I just uh, rotated it through 90 degrees. But basically we can do quite a good job with the very simplest water potential in getting the orthobaric curve. And here we use one Leonard Jones site for the oxygen and a few parcel charges here in order to represent the dipole moment of water and indeed the hydrogen bonding. And if you get more sophisticated with the potential, certainly if you include polarization, you can improve this fit, but already I think it's really rather good. And the beautiful thing about this is you can get the surface tension. Now look at the surface tension. Really wonderful agreement between the simulated surface tension and uh, which, is, which you get from uh, the difference between the normal pressure and the tangential pressure as you move through the surface. And I showed this result to John Rollinson at, at a conference. And he said, they gave you that look that only a supervisor reserves for their ex-student. Uh, and he said to me, are you absolutely sure about this, Dominic? And um, I, think he was I think he was worried that you could get such a, a decent set of curves for the surface tension for a complicated fluid like water, when he had struggled manfully to get the uh, surface tension of uh, argon, liquid argon out, and uh, had failed. And let me show you what, you, what, what happens with liquid argon. 
So it turns out that whatever you do, you can get quite a good coexistence curve. But when you then get the surface tension, it's always about, for the Lennon Jones fluids, it's always about 14 to 15% too high. This raises, why is this? I think this is because of the very strong this dispersion interaction of a large system. And that calls into account the three body effects in the fluid, the dipole induced, dipole induced, dipole induced in axle rod teller interaction. And of course, this is important to think about when we're doing Gibbs simulations as well. I mean, it's quite difficult, isn't it, to imagine you're going to get a really good coexistence if you use an effective pair potential, which is good for the liquid. And at the same time, you get an, a, use an effective pair potential, which is not good for the gas. So we have to worry a little bit about that. I don't think it's too obvious in the coexistence curves. But as I say, it's certainly obvious in the, um, in the uh, surface tensions. I want to show you just a, a recent result that we, that we achieved. And this is some work with uh, Florent Goujon. I'd love to show you his photo, but he's such a private individual. He doesn't allow photos on the web. And Patrice and I uh, in 2014. And here we performed simulations of that argon system again. And we used an extremely accurate two-body potential for the uh, Nasrabad uh, like Hyen Dieter's potential, which uses the kind of uh, quantum mechanical calculations and uh, emphasizes the uh, two-atom two beam calculations in order to get a really accurate feel for the repulsive part of the chemical potential. So I think it's significantly better than the Barker Fisher and Watch potential. And again here now, we see we have the surface tension. We have the surface tension of the Lennon Jones fluid, 14% too high. We have the surface tension of the Barker Fisher Watts fluid and now of the NLD fluid. Now, I want to stress this is not the neat NLD fluid. For both these calculations, we've also had to add the axle rod teller term. And we've not done that by perturbation. We've included the three body forces in the simulation as accurately as we can. I just want to give you, I won't go through this in huge detail, but I just wanted to give you a slight feel for what that calculation looks like. Let's just take one of these points. So you can see here that at say 90, the, uh, the two body or calculated simulation contribution to the surface tension in Leonard Jones units here is about 12.28. And uh, there is a long range correction for that, which is significant about uh, 0.88. But it's also a negative uh, free body interaction, uh, which you calculate in the simulation, uh, for which you will need a, a slightly different formula for the, for the virial pressure. And that's negative and, and practically cancels out the two body contribution. And then a significant free body correction from the long range part of the free body interaction. And this you can't calculate unless you know the full pair distribution function. So you have to have a tabulated pair distribution function. And even then you need to use the superposition approximation to make a, an accurate calculation of the long range correction. And when you put those numbers together, you can see right across the temperature range, you get a really small derivation or difference between the experimental and uh, the, uh, the simulated surface tensions. You'll be pleased to know that you don't lose any agreement with the coexistence curve. So here for argon then is the coexistence curve of the NLD, um, uh, really accurate two body potential, combined with the axelrod teller three body term, uh, compared with experiment, right up to a critical point, which seems to be slightly below that of experiment. So I would say that the exact simulations of um, liquid vapor interfaces are, are really quite productive. And, are very interesting for the future. I've seen, uh, and Jose, uh, sorry, uh, my, my colleague uh, Patrice Malfrey has done some beautiful work on mixtures. So there are alcohol water mixtures, which tend to be homogeneous, okay? So you get two different densities, but they're uniform across the box in the liquid and gas phases. And I've also seen perfectly respectable uh, simulations of liquid-liquid phases. But I've seen very few actually beyond simulate where attempts to simulate liquid liquid vapor equilibria in the way that you would need to do to predict those two component those six uh, parts of the, uh, of the six different types of two phase equilibrium. I've seen very little evidence of using those uh, type of calculations to, to calculate real phase equilibrium. And I think it's an interesting possibility for the future. 
So I've added what I can uh, to the story. I simply want to thank those that I've been uh, involved with. It goes without saying that I'm very grateful to Phanasis. I mean, first of all, for receiving the paper, which we did manage to get published quickly, and then for his generosity in sharing his ideas with us and working with us uh, to extend uh, two mixtures. Uh, this is a little picture of the Auvergne, of Clermont-Ferrand, where Patrice works and where I've spent many happy months. It looks like the moon, only it's greener. Also produces really excellent cheese. And I want just then to thank those people who I have, what I, I would call received really good mentorship from over the years. And I particularly want to thank John Rowlandson, who, who died only recently. It was a wonderful uh, mentor and uh, uh, an outstanding researcher um, and uh, quietly encouraged us to get on with what we wanted to do. I particularly want to thank Keith Gummins. I haven't done this enough, but both uh, Keith and, and, uh, and uh, both uh, Fanassus and I, as young men, enjoyed being looked after by Keith. You know, he, he helped us to get on. He showed us a great deal of generosity and uh, support and left us uh, to do things that we were interested in um, and, and, and was a great, great source of support. I want to thank Bill Street, who taught me how to do simulations, who, by the way, was also an outstanding experimentalist when it came to doing these very high pressure measurements of liquid-liquid uh, vapor systems. And then my colleague, Mike Allen, who I haven't published with, <laughs> but whom I've spent many, many happy hours discussing and talking about nature of simulations of all types in producing our two editions of the book. And then finally, I'd just like to say a big thank you to those people I've worked with, particularly Mike Stapleton, uh, Jose Camagia Lopez, my postdoc, Patrice Malfray, who was also my postdoc in London, Florent Goujon, who I, I only met in Clermont, but has been a great co-worker, uh, Jose Alejandre for his work on water. I haven't, I, I tried to pretend to you that, that, that the SPCE model would solve all the problems of the, the interface of water, but Vladimir Sokin and I did quite a lot of work on trying to model the, uh, the some frequency second harmonic generation spectroscopy at the interface and also to uh, have a look at the, um, the uh, potential drop across the water interface caused by the alignment of the dipoles. And these simple models will not do that. You probably need something polarizable. So with that, I want to finish and to thank you all very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Dominique. On a personal note, I have to say that it's lovely to see you as a Scrooge at the beginning of the talk and then taking a detour towards the quantum world in, in, towards the end of it. Really a pleasure. So um, I see that Panos has replied or has answered the, the two pending questions from his talk. So I think we're now ready to take a few questions for Dominique before we move to the uh, more informal uh, part of our, of our conversation. Uh, Patrice wants to point out that this is that you just showed a beautiful image of our French region Auvergne with wells of potential. So thank you very much, Dominic. <laughs> Good. Um, I, if we have questions from our panelists, they are also very welcome to ask them. If not. Maybe we can uh, regain a little bit of the, of the time that we have used in other ways before and then move to the interview and recollection part of this uh, um, online session for the Sika Marvel Classics in simulation and modeling. And so I invite Beren Smith to sort of uh, take charge of what's going to happen in the next uh, 40 to 45 minutes. Thank you, Beren. Thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, it's uh, the the Gibbs Ensemble really takes me back to my own thesis because what, what I sort of have in, in common with, uh, with Dominic is that as soon as we saw, uh, we saw the work, we started to work on it uh, ourselves. And uh, that was uh, a lot of fun and a, a lot of pleasure. But uh, I, I already uh, asked a, a question to Tronosis a, a long time ago. And um, uh, he also gave the answer in his presentation, but I think we, we, he could elaborate a, a, a little bit more because I think many people um, 
in the audience, especially the young ones, are dying to know which bus stop it is in Oxford. So if they lack inspiration, <laughs> they can actually go there uh, to NASA. So can you tell us the secret of the bus stop and tell a little bit of more um, about what happened at that bus stop? And the other thing is, you may have changed the story a little bit, because when I ask you, you were worried about your career and not about the weather that was groomy. So which part of the story is true? So these are both, both. So uh, the bus stop is uh, uh, Wilvercoat uh, Road, I believe the name. Um, I used to, to live, uh, uh, we had a wonderful, um, uh, townhouse um, on the on the commons on the uh, on the Oxford commons the uh, uh, beautiful green um, and on uh, on many days I would bike but on rainy days uh, I wouldn't uh, and so yes I was worried about my career very much because you know I had I had the position uh, waiting for me and that was good and I had done some reasonable work, but I didn't really know what it is I was going to work on uh, during my postdoc or in my, in my um, faculty career. Um, and so that, that, was, um, that came out of that sort of period of intense questioning, what it is and what am I going to do? Um, so when I was uh, sort of looking at that method, what, what I thought was your um, sort of this genius step is but never have been done in, in simulations directly to indirectly couple two boxes. Right. And, and, and can you uh, tell us a little bit what, what generated that idea? Um, I tried to because show that, that those, those sketches. So the classical thermodynamic thinking that Bo Breed uh, inspired mm -hmm. always had, you know, you write equilibrium conditions by coupling systems and, and making perturbations and writing the effects of that on the, on the energy and then minimizing that and, and deriving the equilibrium conditions for that. So that was the, that's the closest I can think of. Um, I mean, in retrospect, it's not a very, a very difficult thing to consider. Um, yeah, but nobody else did it. Yeah, I mean, I was I was in the right place at the right time, or something like that. Like you can say. Um, yeah. and, and why did you think it would work? What? Why did you think it would work? I, I gave it when 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 the idea came. You know, I sketched it on on, on paper and thought a little bit about it, and I said there is absolutely no reason why this wouldn't work. It took literally a week of coding to implement that. Leonard Jones, it's not that difficult. It's, I mean, I had code for the test particle insertions. So most of the stuff is common, if you wish, if you do NPT and test particle insertions. I learned simulation, I should say, and I should have mentioned that uh, in my talk from a book by Alan and Tildesley. And uh, that, was the, uh, the, the main source um, for self-study and, and understanding simulation. So I had written codes, not optimal, but okay. And then I took those and translated them into GIMPs. Um, and so that's, uh, that's it, wasn't, it didn't take very long to demonstrate that the idea works. Um, once you have some some simple code, but you writing. made it sound that you just tried it and see whether it, whether it was working, and you didn't really have when you started with it an idea of it it should work because there is no interfacial tension and we and the the system can lower its free energy to separate yeah, um, into uh, yeah. I you know I, I I thought it would work, but then I didn't really have the greatest. Um, faith in, in, in my own you know, ability. Am I writing these equations correctly? Am I deriving the acceptance? I've, I had never done this before. And my, I'm a chemical engineer. You know, I'm not a, a statistical mechanic. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> right. so, and, and I wrote it incorrectly as I wrote. I had a one over n factor that wasn't quite right in my derivation because it was classical. It wasn't looking at microstates. So I had no I mean, I, I had hope and an and inkling that it was going to work, but I wasn't really sure until I had actually coded it and, and demonstrated that it agrees. Um, before I forget, I should say that nowadays, unfortunately, 
for Dominic. Uh, the Bible for simulations that I give to every student of mine who starts and has a big chapter on the Gibson sample is by Frankel and Smith, the, uh, the classic uh, <laughs> understanding molecular simulations textbook. But I'm lucky to be the interviewer, so we can ignore that remark. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I, I, uh, Dominic, I, Dominic coming, coming to that book, um, so I, you may not recall this, but uh, when I was a PhD student, just after uh, the article of analysis out, I visited you in, in your, your lab in Southampton. Mm. And that was very nice because um, you shared with me your article, which was then just accepted in molecular physics. So I still remember it. I can show it to you because it's accepted. It wasn't out yet, but it was accepted. So it, it, it really helped me. So I, it's very nice to, to, to thank you for that. But what I also recall from this visit is you were a little bit upset because you had written this beautiful book. But at that time, it wasn't the most cited article of the most cited work in Southampton because you had competition from flies and pots on yeah, the. Right. It was the year of cold fusion. It uh, was the year of cold fusion. And, and, so, I, and I was working on this very paper in my office uh, on, a, uh, on a bank holiday Monday afternoon. I was keen in those days. And uh, there was a rat a tat tat at the night door downstairs. And uh, outside the night door were a dozen journalists. And I was the one who answered the door. They didn't have the key. So they said, uh, could we speak to Martin Fleischmann? And I said, well, no, and he's not here at the moment. He said, OK, well, just let us in so we can photograph his lab. And I said, well, he doesn't have a lab at the moment. And then the journalist from The Sun said, well, just let us in so we can photograph any lab and pretend it's Martin's lab. Yeah. So we didn't, let them, uh, we didn't let them into the building. But it was a it was a great moment uh, and a distraction from what was going on, which was lovely to have, uh, as I say, a visit from Parnassus. I want you to just hark back to Oxford here. Yeah? I think the bus stop is probably at the corner of the Banbury and the Woodstock roads, so Parnassus. But the the um, it was a wonderful place to be. I mean, John Ronanson uh, he, he didn't collaborate a lot with anybody except Ben Widham, yeah? who was uh, who was there most of the time. And um, but he attracted a huge number of visitors to the lab. So Keith was often there, yeah, which was wonderful. Okay. Nassus was there. Uh, I met uh, Bill Street. I don't know what would have happened to me if I hadn't met Bill Street at the beginning of the second year of my, my PhD, because he really understood molecular simulation and helped me to at least get started on it you know, in a big way. We made lots of errors, but you know, we, we got started. I'm not sure I would have ever got off the ground if I'd just been sitting there by myself. So it was a wonderful place to be because of the company, because of the number of people who showed up. Um, Nick Quirk and others um, was, was a great- George group. Jackson was a PhD student. George was a I, great, yeah. Right. Exactly. Now the editor of Molecular Physics, I think, or whatever it yeah. is. Yeah. So that was a wonderful place to be. And I wanted to make one other remark again about, uh, I kind of uh, drew this picture of myself as Scrooge sitting over the desk with this bunch of envelopes saying humbug, and it was like that occasionally on a Monday morning. But there is a great pleasure in editing a journal, which is occasionally, as, uh, as Arthur Miller tells us in The Death of a Salesman, the, the jungle is dark but full of diamonds. And there is uh, occasionally uh, in, uh, in, in the work as an editor, a diamond moment. And, and, I, and I strongly recommend it to, you, to younger people to take the job of, of you know, although it's tiresome and difficult and, and time consuming, to take the job of editorship because of the range of things that you get to see and the kind of wonderful opportunity that you sometimes get when a paper lands on your desk that you really weren't expecting. It, it, there is, of, uh, of course, the possibility for everybody to, uh, to ask questions in the, in the, the Q&A and uh, if they appear, I, I will ask uh, that question. So please feel free to- uh, There is one for Dominic at the moment. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, but that is, a, that is a very technical one, but I can read it. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the talk, Dominic, and I share that one. Can I ask what the hard sphere represents in the pores simulations? Cross-linking centers of a polymer network, perhaps? Well, it could represent colloidal particles uh, in, in an aerogel. Okay. And, and uh, my feeling is would be that they are maybe probably slightly bigger. 
maybe mm, two nanometers or something of that kind. Uh, so slightly bigger than the hard sphere systems. But there's nothing, I think, in principle which stops us uh, in any, it could be a polymer system, it could be a system of carbon particles. There's nothing, it stop, I think, it stops us getting an experimental measure of that structure, uh, perhaps by uh, reverse Monte Carlo on, on a diffraction pattern, or as Patrick Warren helped me to see when I was working at but to use confocal microscopy to look at the, at the structures of, of some of these complex systems, and then to feed those into the system. If the pore sizes are much bigger, than the ones we looked at, you would simply need much larger systems, but I think that's well within reach. So I would like to think maybe into the future that we might have a Monte Carlo package, which enables us to bring in experimental structures and to simulate the behavior of liquids inside of them. So at the moment they're free particles, but once, they're, once, we've, once we've simulated that structure, the hard sphere structure, um, Brennan then froze the particles. <laughs> the hard spheres weren't free to move. You could decorate those hard spheres in, in any way that you liked. Yeah? <laughs> you could add surfactants onto them or whatever, but there, there's plenty of room there for, for, for moving forward, I think. One thing we didn't discuss, because I don't know the answer to it, is how sensitive those calculations are to the many different similar representations of the pore structure. And I think uh, that's something that, that needs to be investigated. So one might not want to simulate simply one pore structure brought in from the experiment, but one might want to use the radial distribution function from getting garnered from experiment to create an ensemble of different pore structures with the same characteristics and take the average of those when one is looking at the coexistence behavior. Yeah, and I forgot to tell that was a, a question by Michaela Falsheki. Falsheki. Uh, there is another uh, question by Odette Hot, and that is uh, for both of you. It is looking ahead towards the future. What are the perspectives of, this, of the distinguished speakers on machine learning based force fields? Sure, if I may try to answer that. Um, I think the, the perspectives are great for that. Um, in uh, my own group uh, recently, we have been uh, collaborating with uh, Roberto Carr. Um, and, uh, and other people to use uh, machine learning based force fields that uh, reproduce uh, very accurately um, DFT quantum mechanical calculations. Um, specifically, we're just writing a paper we're going to be submitting on, on the scan functional uh, water model and, and the VLE um, for that. Hopefully with the Gibbs Ensemble. Come again? With the Gibbs Ensemble, VLE, or? Could she use no, the Gibbs Ensemble? Uh, no, that's why I'm saying my last, my last slide was that, okay, so this, this is a, it runs maybe a hundred times slower than, than SPC or something like that, but still a thousand times faster than the ab initio MD would be running. But it is very tightly interfaced within labs and, the only realistic way to get the phase behavior is to do interfacial calculations, because if yeah. I have to write all the code to use the machine learning potentials and test them and do them properly, it, it's, it's not realistic for a PhD student. Uh, you'll need multiple people and you'll need programmers to do that properly. Yeah, that, that is clearly In, something that has changed for when we were PhD students. Huh? Exactly. Yeah, that, yeah. And it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't work. So, I am forced, even though in this particular case, it would have been better using smaller systems to use Gibbs Ensemble, I'm forced to use uh, interfacial molecular dynamics. Yeah, and, and it's what you also what you mentioned in your, in your presentation or in the, in the questions that uh, Monte Carlo is really a fantastic technique, but you need right. to tailor it optimally right. for every single particular system. Well, molecular dynamics and others are so general, you can just run, so yep. yeah. Correct. It, it so the answer be. to the question is absolutely machine learning. I, and I was skeptical uh, for a while. You know, uh, in, in chemical engineering, we tend to not like models with lots and lots of free parameters and that are adjusted. But um, it seems to have, have come of age and, and be very useful. Yeah, well, we were raised with the idea that with eight parameters, you can fit an elephant. So what can you do with a million parameters and still get reliable results? So I, I, I see the, the, the point there. 
D Dominic, you, you, you I would know. also just like to support that view. When I, when I worked in Unilever, we had in our modeling group those that did Monte Carlo and molecular dynamic simulations, and a, a group led by a, a, a bright young man called Ian Stott, who spent a lot of time doing uh, work on uh, uh, machine learning and uh, in order to model problems, not necessarily potential functions, but to model many problems. We found it in terms of the time scale, the, the most effective way that we could uh, introduce modeling into the organization. So now I am excited about the idea that we might uh, eventually be able to have a kind of plug-in package, uh, which would enable us to, to create uh, a potential field, which we could use, for instance, to include all of the two and three body terms of a simple molecule like argon uh, just by putting the configurations in and, uh, and learning the field out here. Yeah? So I think that's, that, that bodes well for me for the future. Yeah, it, it seems that right. we just have another tool in our toolbox which we can use very effectively and very interestingly. So, so I have another question from, uh, from Costas. Um, uh, I have a question. Uh, just by running NVT on a homogeneously initial system, for example, Lagrangeot fluid, we can see spinodal decomposition and the formation of a slab configuration. What is the problem with this way to obtain phase diagrams compared to chemical potential calculations or GEMC? Uh, mm. Um, Dominic, you wanted to... And no, I can't answer that, uh, Francis. I don't know the answer to that, simply. I don't sure I understand what it is. I know that... Well, we okay, so let me, let me try to answer this. Mm. So, in principle, you could do that, although in a, in a system of, say, in a cubic box with a few hundred Lennard-Jones particles, you will not see a slab, you will not see a droplet, you'll see a mess that is hard to tell what is liquid, what is not. Um, if you had a, a, an elongated box and let it go for enough time, it may eventually condense to a slab with a liquid and a vapor. And there is no problem with that. And that's, I, I, uh, interfacial molecular dynamics are exactly that. You don't have to start them as a slab. In principle, you can start homogeneous and the system will decompose and form a slab and two coexisting phases. The, the problem, is that to get to equilibration, you need maybe not microseconds, but certainly hundreds of nanoseconds for a typical system. And you need a few thousand molecules to have enough of a bulk liquid and enough of a bulk vapor or second liquid. So the efficiency of that is much lower than when you can isolate a little piece of the liquid in periodic boundary conditions, a little piece of the vapor or the second liquid, and couple them thermodynamically. So the advantage of the Gibbs is computational efficiency. In the historical period that we covered in the 80s and 90s, you didn't really have the option to run molecular dynamics calculation for hundreds of nanoseconds or a microsecond. So you couldn't do this at all. Now you can. And, and you only want to use the Gibbs ensemble when it is absolutely imperative that you have the maximum computational efficiency. For example, in the, in the quantum calculations that Dominic very nicely presented or in, in ab initio-based uh, potentials. Yeah, I would, I'd like to, to bring up the point. I, I'm kind of, I cannot imagine, for instance, doing a molecular dynamics calculation in which I, I started with a, um, a mixture, a liquid mixture of my two components in equilibrium of the gas, and then kind of moved into a region where I was expecting three phases and hoping to watch before my very eyes, the two liquid phases separate out beautifully to form an interface and both of them to form an interface with the gas. I just do not think that is going to happen on the kind of time scales that we have available. So, but I, I may be wrong. Somebody may have done this and, and done it well, but but I can't I can't imagine it myself. Yeah? Well, it it I, I I must say I have done this recently and it works again mm -hmm. over hundreds of nanoseconds of, yeah. of time. Yeah, and it's also a little bit what you where you're interested in. If you're interested in the interface, that's what you want to do. But if you're that's just right. in a simple system interested in the bulk, why, why would you do that? Yeah. Sure. 
So if I were really interested in interviews, I think I might do the Gibbs simulation first, yeah? To give me the parameters of the two of the coexisting phases and then set up the slabs and then do molecular dynamics using those kind of starting configurations. Yeah, and, and, and it's of course the work of Ilya Sitman huh, that, that, that he basically say you can calculate the vapor liquid curve so efficiently that we can now make a model that, that works uh, over the entire phase coexistence curve. So if you're interested in the viscosity of a liquid, you at least have the liquid at the right state point. And, and, and these kind of things, to, to be able to calculate these kind of things efficiently allowed him to, to optimize the force fields and those kind of things. And uh, so for those kind of things, efficiency is, is really important. And he wouldn't be able to calculate these force fields without uh, the Gibbs ensemble. Uh, I have here a very uh, interesting question, which is very close to my heart, because this is a typical um, comment uh, which you often get if you submit a paper uh, doing machine learning, at least if we submit it, is from uh, Redland and Bell. I feel that machine learning prevents any understanding of the system. Do the uh, speakers have a similar problem with the method? Thank you very much, Ruth, for a good question. Uh, I'd, I'd like to, I, I think I'm going to disagree. Um, I think that, um, you know, if one is interested, for instance, in the various um, contributions to the, uh, the surface tension, then it's difficult from a machine learning potential to separate out the electrostatic and, and, and the dispersion interaction. But if, for instance, one were simply interested in looking at a phenomenon such as the uh, potential drop across the water interface, um, that for me, it doesn't matter where your potential comes from. It doesn't matter whether your machine learned it or you, you've programmed it in. I mean, the phenomena are going to be the same. The interpretation of the phenomena will be the same. The breakdown of the various contributions to the phenomena, I agree, is going to be difficult. I, I completely agree. Um, with whom? At, with Dominic or with, with Dominic? Bell? I, I completely agree with Dominic. Um, That's really <laughs> and and uh, one may yes, in a simpler potential, it's easier to see what is the effect of different parameters. On, uh, but it's the same thing. You can ask the question: What do you learn by running a an ab initio molecular dynamics calculation? Um, you get an answer. But how is that uh, attributed to specific elements in the system? I don't know if you can if you can get that. Well, you can also envision these DFT or the machine learning of, on DFT potentials as basically, yeah, a, a faster representation of the DFT, of DFT potential. Exactly. That's, so, the way so I, I, that's exactly it, the way I look at it. Yeah. So I think the, the 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 underlying idea that there is some understanding in that one. Uh, it's probably not even the aim of the machine learning. It, it's just to speed up the calculation in a, in a way you can do with machine learning. But there are other machine learning studies that are more aimed at trying to understand phenomena. Okay. So, so but I, I think this discussion of machine learning will continue for, for some time. So Ilya, uh, um, Ilya made a, a remark that just to, I think, to clarify something. It's not really a question, so I think everybody can, can it's, it's, read that. It's a that. great comment. It yeah. is a great paper he's, uh, he's uh, referencing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So everybody can read that. I, I assume, Sarah, There's a paper by Kurt Binder the, 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 the question? Yes, the, the yeah, okay. Q&A. Yeah. So, so Thanosis, I, I have a, a, another question for you. And, and maybe that's a little bit of a strange one. But you're so famous for the Gibbs ensemble. So is it difficult for you to talk to, to that people, the scientific community allows you to talk anything else with the Gibbs Ensemble? So, so, so how, how difficult uh, is it to get away from the Gibbs Ensemble? It, it's, it's uh, I tried to explain that in my talk, right? Yeah, I, yeah, I mentioned that, yeah. I, I, I think I made it quite clear that besides the original development and some early work, I haven't really worked on the Gibbs Ensemble. Uh, yeah mid nineties. And so I think a lot of the scientific community may, people doing computing, people doing molecular simulations, yes, know that I did that, but I, I don't know that they think of me as 
the Gibbs Ensemble man because I'm, I'm not doing this anymore. I it, 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 the is, that, is that the reality or you still get the invitations to talk about like this one, but that's an exception. No, this, so this has been the first Gibbs Ensemble talk in 10 years, maybe. Because oh, okay. I just don't seek, don't, don't, don't want that to be my my defining. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. So let me just. Sure. Say, I mean, yeah. Go on. Let me just say that I'm not quite so famous as Vanessa, so I'm grateful for any invitation to talk about it. <laughs> well, well, that's not completely <laughs> true. Uh, because, uh, you still were the most cited person in uh, Southampton after. Fleischmann that he was. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm wondering whether that has changed because you, the, the, the book you wrote with Alan and Tildesley was really a, 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 I just a, wanted to say one, one small thing when we wrote the first edition which was I think in 1987 yes. we were definitely not in time to include the, yes. the, yes. the Gibbs you just did a little, a little uh, the next I edition tell you, Oxford University Press were very kind and enabled us to do a reprint yeah? and yeah. Uh, the one thing that I insisted on which Mike agreed on I insisted on a number of things, but Mike didn't agree on most of them. Uh, but the one thing that I insisted on and that Mike agreed very much on is that we would put a little piece on that we thought this was exciting enough just to add a small bit. And uh, we tried to address it more thoroughly in the second edition. Yep. So, so Dominic, I, I have a question for you. I, you may not uh, like this question, but you have this dark period in your career where you went to the dark side called industry, Unilever. Yes. And, and can you give some perspective of uh, maybe not the Gibbs Ensemble, but uh, how you saw their molecular simulations, the, the future of molecular sim simulations in industry? Can you share a little bit of that uh, I'm very, experience? I'm very, I'm, I'm very happy to talk about that. And uh, one of the reasons that, that it was such a joy for me to go to, uh, to Unilever was that uh, there was already a very well-established uh, simulation team there. Uh, Patrick was there uh, and uh, Ian Stott and Mike Turpin and uh, Tim Madden, uh, Rob Grote from, from the Netherlands. So, you know, we, I was very fortunate. It's a great place to work. We, and there was a wide range of interest. So we were able from the, the businesses to get funding for simulation work almost every year without difficulty. As I say, the, the type of simulation work which paid off best with, with the was the artificial intelligence work that we did of, say, looking at designing novel peptides for uh, antimicrobial behavior and, and, and that kind of stuff. But, but it was very useful. Uh, there were many differences. I mean, one of, the, one of the joys is to try to create something which is um, going to be uh, uh, useful for consumers. Uh, and uh, one quick example, there's a huge amount of work going on in the deodorancy business of Unilever to look at more effective deodorants, those which uh, uh, killed the, uh, the, uh, the molecules that are responsible for the, uh, for the unpleasantness in, in, in the underarm. And we were able to design some chelating agents to do that. Unfortunately, those chelating agents were then also able to take the dye out of every cotton shirt, uh, which somebody wore during the process. So we had to go back and do a redesign. So, you know, learning to work in a framework where there were interesting consumer problems uh, was a great pleasure. I'm disappointed that Unilever doesn't seem to have been able to carry on with that work. It, 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 it has gone into this fashion, uh, I think, um, well, understandably, of open innovation of wishing to do much of its more basic research outside the company. But I think this is a, a dangerous position because you can never be quite sure uh, whether, you know, you need, you need some expertise within, I believe, to understand the quality of what you're dealing with outside. Yeah? So is that enough for you? Oh yeah, yeah. But, oh. but I, I'm pretty sure you can continue for a long time, but I, I do still have another question for the Nussets. And it's somewhat related huh? because, uh, uh, we we sort of both grow, grew up in, uh, in in this chemical engineering environment uh, for for say the molecular uh, thermodynamics say the the Prausnitz school the uh, read the, uh, and um, I, I still remember that we were together in, in one of those conferences of uh, uh, say engineering thermodynamics and we we sort of had the feeling that molecular simulation will take over that field. Yes. But I, I, I'm not so sure that ever happens. What is your view on that? 
So it, um, it never did uh, in that it is still not a tool that the chemical or petrochemical companies would use to replace the, the uh, phenomenological, mostly phenomenological models they have in, uh, in, in house. Um, some, some aspects of it or some tools, uh, for example, DPD, uh, dissipative particle dynamics that uh, our esteemed SICAM uh, director and, and others have developed, uh, Patrick Warren and so on, is quite useful in, in, in many industries. And I think Dominic has uh, uh, worked uh, also in, in that field. Um, quantum mechanical calculations are widely used in, 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 in pharmaceutical and other companies trying to design or catalyst design. Uh, molecular simulation itself is not, not, not working as well. I'm sorry, there's a call, heating is off at my house and the repair people are calling me. So I need to take one minute off. I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. So can I uh, then move to, 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 to Dominic? And um, so, so there, there are probably in the audience quite some, some young scientists that um, think about a career in molecular simulation mm. or not. So do you have some advice for them? I think you should, very simple advice. I think you should try to, to do what brings you joy in your life, yeah? Um, and if, um, and I think there are, there are plenty of opportunities within the academic sphere to have a successful career in, in, in all aspects of simulation and modeling. I think there are plenty of opportunities in the industrial sphere. When I was working with the Royal Society of Chemistry, I made a rather bold statement, which I said that within five years, no chemist would start an experiment without doing some modeling. Uh, in front of it. It was probably uh, uh, too bold a statement. But I think many people now uh, in industry are, are using uh, packages uh, to look at structures. So when you're, when you're writing a reaction on a fume covered hood, it's one thing to be able to, uh, to draw a, a curly arrow as to where you think the electrons are going. But it's another thing to be able to do a fairly primitive and basic calculation just to confirm the structure of what the orbitals might look like in the reaction. So I think a lot of this does go on. And I think the more we're able to package up the, um, the Monte Carlo calculations, the uh, potential energy uh, calculations we've been discussing, the more we're able to package those, the more we're able to make them useful to people who are not experts in the field, the more the methods are going to be used. So I can just take one step back and say, I would strongly recommend, I've had a, uh, a fantastic career. I mean, I think I joined at a good time. So 1976, there were no uh, laptops. Uh, you know, all the machines, Bill Street and I did our first calculations on a CDC 7600. So we would send the code off to Manchester late at night and 20 time steps would come back the following morning. When I was at West Point, these time steps had been folded into a neat pile by a non-commissioned officer and handed to me. Uh, the non-commissioned officer wearing a pair of gloves. So it was um, it was absolutely wonderful time uh, to begin uh, to begin simulation, uh, uh, a kind of open field. All of the work had been done previously by people like Anis Rahman and uh, and others um, at national laboratories, which had those computing facilities. As soon as they began to become available through national machines, they weren't available in departments. But as soon as they became available for national machines, it was a wonderful opportunity. So I'm very glad I took it. Very glad I met Bill Street. I'm very glad I didn't try to do, continue to do non-spherical perturbation theory for the rest of my career, yeah? So yes, I like it. Uh, Thanosis, to you the, the, the same question, and that is uh, a little bit uh, towards the, 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 the young people that are listening here, can you re recommend them to, to start a career in molecular simulation, computer simulations, and um, except from visiting the right bus stop in, in Oxford, what, what advice can you give? Um, I absolutely think that uh, the broader field, I wouldn't call it uh, 
molecular simulation is, uh, I think, fairly, fairly specific, a bit too narrow for the moment. I think the broader field of computational science uh, of which we are part, um, the, the, the molecular simulations, I think, are evolving more towards ab initio or quantum calculations, which are going to be, I think, a lot more uh, dominant uh, down the line than, than uh, molecular level models of the type we have been looking at. But the field overall is going to be driven by better algorithms, better methods, uh, machine learning and AI, and the great uh, continuing uh, power of, of computing systems, which are, are everywhere now. So uh, I absolutely think it's, it's a great field to be in. I, I think uh, the experience of recent graduates uh, uh, supports that. Um, in terms of advice, I think I will, I will uh, say similar things. Just follow something you really feel strongly about and you enjoy doing. Uh, for the longest time, I was uh, really perplexed at the fact that people were willing to pay me to do something I loved so much. Uh, so young people need to follow their heart and, 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 and be in an area that they really enjoy working in and then things will come. Um, it helps to have good mentors uh, and this isn't something that is easy to come by, but but perhaps there's a little bit of, of control one has as to where they choose to go and whether uh, the people they associate with, uh, they feel can support their development personally and professionally. Thank you very much. I think this is a, a nice moment to give back uh, the, uh, the, the chair to, uh, to Sara or some uh, Closing words. In thank you very much, Beren. And yes, I mean, I, I just want to, to thank uh, the three of you for, for sharing with us this afternoon. This was a, a real pleasure. I mean, these, these um, classics have a way of uh, turning into uh, moments of, of personal advice and shared experiences. And I think that they are precious also because of that, not just because of their scientific and technical contents. So Thanos, thank you very much. I, I look forward to inviting you to SICAM to talk about anything but the Gibson Sample in the near future. Very good. That is going to be uh, our pleasure and our mission from now on. Um, you were talking about the importance of mentorship. I mean, I, I, I think we need to acknowledge that, that both Dominic and Beren, uh, together with Mike Allen and Diane Frankel, have invested a lot of their time, energy, and intelligence into uh, providing tools and the two books that, uh, that I often quote as the Bibles. Two out of three, actually. I have a third one that I also like, which is the book by Mark Tuckerman. Uh, but two of the three Bibles that, that uh, we keep returning to when we want to study or learn or learn more or learn again new things. So thank you, Dominic, and thank you, Beren, for that. And then Beren talked about you know, dark times in, in the lives and careers of, uh, of people that are dear to us. I, I cannot help but mentioning the fact that both Dominic and Beren have also invested time, energy, and effort in serving the community as directors of SICAM. And this is also something for which we are very, very, very grateful. So um, that is the extent of what I wanted to say before parting ways and, and wishing you all a very nice end of the afternoon. I just wanted to um, go back to, to the uh, list of upcoming events that we have scheduled for December, January, and February. So Emanuela Zaccarelli next Thursday uh, on colloidal systems. And then what I uh, think is going to be a very worth follower of this uh, Sika Marber Classics uh, in, in January, Lucia Reining and Steve, Steve Louis and Rex Goldby. Um, Sharon Glotzer for the Marvel Distinguished Lecture on February 8th. And then, um, and this is something that I hope is going to be also quite a special afternoon, our uh, From Women's Eyes uh, conversation on February 11th. I was super happy to see Ruth uh, among the participants to this uh, event today. With that, 
I just wish to thank you all again, uh, our speakers, our panelists, our participants for your questions and engagement in this, in this uh, session of the Sika Marvel Classics. And I'm really looking forward to the next opportunity to see you all, even though online. And I hope that at some point we'll be able to, to start seeing more and more of you in person in Lausanne. Bye, and thank you very much.